Hey, it's Ryan from Roundnet, and we'd like to welcome you to Screen Printing. As you start your journey in screen printing, we welcome you along the way and we offer our help and support as you learn through this process. This DVD is going to show you how to use your screen printing starter kit effectively and efficiently in your environment. If you notice, we're in a kitchen right now. A lot of our other DVDs are filmed and the YouTube videos that you might have seen are filmed in a large production shop. We realize as you're starting, as myself when I started, I started in a kitchen or in a house or in a laundry room. So we're doing it in your environment using all the supplies that come in the screen print starter kit and showing you the available tools that most people will have as you start screen printing. You know, this process of screen printing is a lot of fun, it's very creative, it's artistic, and it really can take you a long ways. I actually started printing shirts for my band, and we started in my mom's kitchen. We made a mess out of the place, we didn't know how to do it, but it ended up printing shirts for other bands, and then one day, one of the bands actually wanted us to show them how to print shirts, which eventually led us to start selling this stuff. You know, eight, ten years later down the road, here we are now, and you're starting with our screen print starter kit. So we're excited to teach you. We're very passionate about screen printing in this industry and helping our customers. So along this process, if there's anything that we can do to help you guys out, just give us a call. You can also interact with us on Facebook and YouTube. We have 600, 700 videos on YouTube available that show all the different processes of screen printing. <laughs> Let's go ahead and begin by going over what you received in your package. First, you have your screen printing press. This is disassembled. So we'll show you how to set everything up, of course. Part of that press, you have a platen that will come disassembled from the press as well. Now remember your screen print instructions and keep these by your side at all times. They're colored instructions, very easy to follow through the process. It's a great resource along with this DVD. You have your exposure light with a bulb and hardware that come attached and your exposure extension stand, which will show you how to attach to your press later. Back to your supplies over here. You have your DVD, which you're watching right now, of course. You have gloves, film positives, and parchment paper that help in the curing process after you print the shirt. You also have some nifty little cleanup cards, which we'll be using to clean up the prints. Before we actually start the screen printing process, we use a light safe yellow bulb, which will show you how to create a darkroom environment for the exposure process. We also prep the screen with degreaser using these scrub brushes right here we'll show you how to use. This is your screen of course. It's a wooden screen that comes in your package. We also have your emulsion which is sensitized using the sensitizer and a scoop coater to apply that emulsion. Then we have some Probron palette adhesive which sticks your shirt to your palette. Some tape to tape the screen up. Our squeegee to print the ink. You got two colors of ink, both white and black ink for dark and light shirts. And then once you get done cleaning up, we have emulsion remover to take the image off the screen so you can actually put more images on the screen. That covers everything that comes in your package. Now let's cover some essential components needed to create the printing process before we actually set the equipment up. As you notice, we're in a kitchen environment. The kitchen's great because it has everything that you need. Also someplace like a laundry room or a bathroom or someplace where you have access to water maybe some heat depending on how you want to cure your garments. People can use any room in their house. You can use a shop or an office. The things that you need are water. So right here we have our sink. We also have a spray nozzle in the sink to spray out the screen. Now when we get in the darkroom process, the more water pressure you have the better. So you don't have to have a spray nozzle, but optimally if you have high pressure, even like a small little pressure washer, it's going to clean your screen better. Next we have an open countertop space. We'll show you how to attach the press to that open countertop space. You want to print, or at least in your darkroom process, in a closed environment. So you don't want to have a room that has a lot of light coming into it. You need to be able to block the windows, which we have shades in our windows in this room, so that you can set up a light safe environment using the yellow bulb you got in your kit. Also, this is an oven. You can actually use an oven to cure your t-shirts. Now you can also use an iron or a heat gun, so we'll show you all the three different ways to cure your t-shirts. So a kitchen works great, a laundry room, a spare office. Now keep in mind screen printing is a little messy, so if you can do it in an environment where you can easily clean things up like a kitchen um, and you're not, it's not like a super, super nice kitchen, so if you spill a little ink on the place, your parents or your wife's not going to flip out at you. And I don't know my wife would if I printed uh, shirts in my kitchen. So you want to do it in an area that you don't mind getting a little dirty. 
Now, this pro these are all water-based products, and they're all environmentally friendly products that you've got in your kit. So you can clean them up. It's not like you can't clean them up. But just to preface that, if you leave the ink on a certain surface for a while, it might stain it. So you make, want to make sure that you're using an environment that can get a little dirty, which would be you know, the optimal environment, or clean things up right away, which I'll show you how to do. So let's go ahead and get started by setting our equipment up. Now, as part of this press assembly, you have your clamp head, which is your screen clamp. You have your pallet. You have four screws. You have your off-contact adjustments and tilt adjustment brackets. And you have your press. The first step of the process is actually going to be to set the platen up. However, before we do that, there are a couple things that you need. Screwdriver, either electric or manual. Electric is better, and with a Phillips screw head. A half-inch wrench and or a crescent wrench. Either of these will work. Um, you do need two. All right, now it's the time to attach the shock. So we're going to take our ball stud right here, and we're going to attach it to that area of the arm. All we have to do is we simply take this, and we simply impress this onto there, and that attaches the shock. Now, that shock's a pretty strong shock. So if you try to push the screen down, and it won't go down all the way, keep in mind that this shock is strong. So you might need the leverage of a frame in here to actually push this down. But if I put some pressure down, I can see that. If you need to take this off for any reason, it's really easy to take off. Simply take a screwdriver, put, pull it off like that by simply releasing that lever, and then once again, pushing it on. Also really easy, just simply clamps on like that. You'll notice that your platen actually has pre-drill holes in it. To set this up, it's easiest to turn the press upside down before you do anything else. So this is the first step of the process. Turn the press upside down, and we're actually going to use the screen to set under the press and place our platen on. So we'll just use the screen to kind of set our platen up. Next, we'll take our four screws, and we're going to be using an electric screwdriver because that is the easiest. And then we'll align the drill holes to the holes underneath the platen. And we'll start screwing these guys in. So you do need to make sure that everything's lined up and you can see down through. And that's why it's good to have a little bit of space in there. So I'm not going to tighten all up immediately. I'm going to drill them in. And then we'll go ahead and tighten after the fact. Now once you have them all in, go ahead and tighten them. We actually have the ratchet set on this so we don't over tighten them. Now the platen is attached. Next let's take our off contact and tilt brackets and attach it to the print head and the print arm. So your hardware is already in place. We're going to simply take the hardware out, keeping our nuts and washers together. And then your bracket aligns like so. So you're going to put both brackets in, and they're going to go like that. So we'll start out with this side first, of course. Put the bottom in. Now at the bottom, it does have a center tube right here that you can see. See that center tube right there? You want to make sure that that's aligned so that the bolt fits through the tube. The top one does not have a center tube, so we simply just take this top bolt and stick it through. Now, we'll go ahead and stick that through the other side, and then there we have it. So once that's attached, just simply take your bolt your nut and your washer, and then attach the other side. And, and then right now, just hand tighten these. Next, we'll take this down. You do have to put some pressure on it to put it in the print position. And then we'll take our nuts and washers off the screen clamp head. And then simply stick the screen clamp head through the off contact brackets. And let's go ahead and turn this around so you can see what we're doing here. You see that? And then put those washer and then the nut on. And these are half inch right here. This is all half inch stuff that we're working with. So when we go to set up and tighten, which we're actually not going to do yet, we will be using that half inch wrench and either another half inch wrench or a crescent wrench. 
So right now the press is in the initial setup mode. We don't want to tighten anything down yet because we're actually going to adjust the screen later. Now you do have to mount the press to something. So you can use a bench, a table, you can even attach it directly to the counter using some bolts or some screws that were provided. Since we are actually going to be using a kitchen, what we did is we went out and cut down a piece of MDF or some type of particle board that we purchased at Home Depot. And that's going to allow us to first attach the press to this before we attach it to the countertop, giving the press the stability needed, but also not ruining our countertop. So, but you do need to attach it to something. And we do recommend when you're attaching that, that you place it so the platen is in a spot that can hang over the edge. You need to be able to get this t-shirt on. So if you're placing it too far in, you can't really get the t-shirt in there. So we're going to place it towards the edge so the platen either hangs off the edge and or is very close to the edge. So they have plenty of room to get our shirt on. That does mean that we need to do this in a sturdy area. So we have a big board here that we're using and it's very sturdy for us to use. And then once again, we're going to be using just the screws that were provided and an electric screwdriver. So you'll notice that now that this press is on the edge, if I weren't to hold on to it, it'd be very loose. And that's why we do need to anchor it down. So now we'll take our screw gun with the provided screws and then can go ahead and attach this in. The next thing we're going to do is adjust our screen clamp head. So we're actually going to use an off-contact plate. We'll discuss off-contact later on in the instructional video. But you don't have to use this. You can set the screen directly onto the print platen. You want to loosen your screen clamp up enough to receive the screen into it. And then once that's high enough, you just simply set the screen in the back of the clamp, square it up to the platen, and that automatically equals and leaves everything in an equal flat adjustment in the back. Now we'll go ahead and tighten up using once again that half inch wrench. Tighten up the off contact adjustments. So just to let you guys know, let's flip this thing around real fast again so you, you can see what we're doing. The off contact adjustments on this press are back here. So off contact means the screen goes up and down. Tilt means the screen goes like that. Now when you're screen printing, as we'll discuss as we get to the print portion of the DVD, you want a flat surface to screen print on. You don't want to print on a surface like this, or you also don't want to print on a surface like this. So it's important that the screen's flat. So we're going to tighten and adjust both the off contact and the tilt using our half inch wrenches. So once again, the screen's centered out and square. So we tighten everything up manually, and we take that half inch wrench, and we don't want to over torque it. So we're just tightening it hand tight there. Now we'll go ahead and tighten the tilt. So the tilt, that's where the second screwdriver or the second wrench comes into play. And that could be either a crescent wrench like we have there or another half inch wrench of course. And then we'll go ahead and tighten this up. The bottom one you do want pretty tight and the top one you want pretty tight as well. If they're not tight enough, what will happen is you might lose tilt during the course of printing, which is something that you don't want to do. When your press is set up correctly, you should be able to bring your screen down. It should be level with the platen. It should not be tilted once again. So if you set it directly on the platen, it should sit down directly. We actually used an off-contact tab, which we'll discuss a little bit more later. So ours is slightly off the platen, the distance of that tab. But it should be level either way. Now let's go ahead and set up our screen exposure light. So our screen exposure light actually consists of a casing. This is a 500 watt halogen light, a bulb, and some brackets that attach it to your press. So the bulb we will attach first. Now it's very important that you do not touch this bulb with your fingertips. So it is very important that we're actually going to use the casing that comes with the bulb to touch it and insert the bulb into the 500 watt halogen light. So we'll go ahead and put that in. And that kind of just slides in there. You got to put some pressure on it to get it into place. We can actually test this just by simply plugging it in. And it works. So we're good to go. You do also get a replacement bulb. So if you do accidentally touch the bulb and it blows out, or if it blows out early, then you have one replacement bulb to replace the bulb with. And you can obviously replace bulbs after that. Next, we'll take our brackets 
and attach them to the 500 watt halogen light casing. Face the L shape facing in and then you'll take your hardware and it attaches the back part of the light like so. So the hardware with the stop bolt on it and then this little guy goes on the inside and the way it's actually set up here is that this thing won't allow that the nut actually does not turn as you tighten it. So you can start to hand tighten it which becomes pretty easy. So what I'll do is I'll actually attach both sides just by hand tightening them. Then I'll get the crescent wrench out and do the final adjustment. So you can see a little bit better from this angle. But simply take your bolt, stick it through, and then you can put this one on that side, and then you simply start hand tightening it up. Once you get to a point where you can no longer hand tighten, that's where you can get the crescent wrench out and take it to the next step. Once our light is assembled, we simply take the screen knob and put the screws and bolts almost all the way down. And then we'll insert this like so into the back of the clamp head, tighten it down the rest of the way, and then straighten this out so it's flat and directly above the center of our platen. The next step of the printing process once all of our equipment is set up is actually prepping your screen for imaging. So we're going to take our wood screen and we're going to degrease it. The degreasing process uses the Rionic degreaser, which comes in the bottle like this, and fills the rest of the bottle up with water, put the squirt bottle on the, the squirt lid on the top. So we're just going to slowly fill the rest of this bottle up. It is sudsy, so you want to make sure that to not fill it too fast. This is a concentrated form, so we're basically diluting it now, making our screen degreaser. And we'll go ahead and put the squirt cap on. We're also going to be using a little red scrub pad. Now, the reason we need to degrease the mesh, because the mesh is dirty. In fact, you can actually see dust and lint on this mesh right now. If we're going to leave that on the mesh when we put our image on the mesh, that would get in the way of our image. and would not create a good screen. The screen printing process involves this screen. Keep that in mind. If you don't make a good screen, you're not going to have a good image. This is just a few hundred dollar press and kit, but you can actually make a professional t-shirt by using this equipment. It's not all about having the best, nicest, you know, thousand dollar piece of equipment. It's about making a good screen. That means starting out with good art, which we'll get to in a second, and imaging a screen. So the first step of that process is giving yourself a nice canvas to work on. We're going to degrease the screen mesh by doing that. So we're using our kitchen sink right here. We'll just put, put the sink in the, we'll put the uh, screen in the sink and we're going to use clean water and just get the screen wet. We'll get it wet on both sides there. Next we'll take just a little tiny bit of degreaser and spray it on both sides. So it does not take a lot of degreaser, just a couple squirts on either side. And what you're going to want to see, I'm actually going to spray the scrub pad too a little bit. What you're going to want to see is this suds up. So as you can see right here, that screen mesh is sudsing up nice and good with that scrub brush. Now you want to make sure that you have a clean environment. So clean sink, clean hands, and that you're using the right scrub brush. You get two scrub brushes. One's for cleaning the screen, and one is for removing the emulsion. You do not want to mix them up. There's not enough, uh, unfortunately, there's not a way to write on the scrub brush. So maybe you want to take like a Ziploc bag, write on the Ziploc bag, degreaser, and then put this in that Ziploc bag afterwards, or maybe just put it in a special spot that says degreaser. The emulsion remover scrub brush, you don't want to get mixed up. We, it, on our website, we actually have nicer scrub brushes with handles. That you can, you know, they're very cheap, a, a couple bucks, and you can actually write on the handle and then you don't have to use your hands. But this is an eco-friendly product, so you don't have to worry about getting it on your hands or smelling it or even using it in your kitchen sink. Once it's degreased, you also want to make sure that you're degreasing the frame too, because that's dirty. So we quickly scrub the screen. And then with, once again, clean water, we're going to rinse the screen off so that all the soap comes off of it. Now this is very important, because if we don't get all the soap off of it, that's also not making a good screen, right? So we don't want to make sure to rinse that screen nice and good on both sides, including the frame. You want to get the frame. And then depending on where you're working at, you know, you can do this process in a bathroom sink, 
in a laundry room sink, even outside or in your garage. It's nice to have towels or shop towels to clean up you know, the mess around the place. And this is why you might want to do it, in, not want to do it in a really, really nice kitchen. But very easy to do. As you can see, even if it does get some water over the place, you get water over the place doing your dishes anyway. So it's, this screen is clean now. What we'll go ahead and do now is let it dry. Now you can let it air dry, or what we're going to do is actually going to plug in a blow dryer and just blow dry it to expedite the process. So a blow dryer is a great tool to use to expedite the drying processes. You don't want to use a paper towel on this. If you use a paper towel, you could be putting contaminants back into the screen. So you can, you know, shake the, shake the water off like so. You also, if you have dirty hands, don't want to touch the screen. Or if you're letting it dry in a dirty environment, that's obviously bad too. So let it dry in a clean environment. And we're going to be using a, a hair dryer right here to speed this up. So we're not going to show you, we're not going to let you watch water dry, but we will Dry this up real fast so we don't see any water on it, and then it's dry. Pretty simple. Our screen is nice and dry, and now it's ready for coating. Now, when you come to the coating process, this is where light becomes involved. The way a screen's actually exposed is you take an unexposed, light-sensitive, what's called photoemulsion, and expose it to light. That photoemulsion is coated onto the screen mesh. We'll show you how to do that in a second, but before we do that, we have to create a light safe environment. Because this photoemulsion exposes or hardens to light, if we were going to use it in a room like this or coat the light sensitive photoemulsion in a room like this, what would happen is that emulsion would immediately start to expose. And because it's wet and it's not dry and it's not properly exposing with an image on it, that would ruin your screen. So we need to create a darkroom environment. Now, when we talk about darkroom, and we teach a lot of classes, by the way, if you ever want to come take a screen printing class, we have them all over the country. They're a ton of fun. And learning the process hands-on is so much better than learning it in a DVD because we can actually show you the right techniques. And you'll see in a second, coding the screen. A lot of people are actually scared to code a screen, but it's one of the things we actually do in classes. And you know, you can try it out on your own, and that's how I learned is on my own. But if you do have the ability to come to a class, come on by. We'd love to have you and actually you know, show you how to code the screen. But the dark room, when we're talking about it in classes, scares people. They think, oh man, I have to have this whole dark room environment. You know, the red dark rooms that you used to have when you're exposing your, uh, your film for your camera. We don't use those types of cameras anymore. But it's not that critical of a dark room. So what we're doing is we're creating a UV-free room. Now, a UV-free room actually involves using your yellow bug light, which we put into a fixture up here. This yellow bug light actually doesn't have any UV light in it. So by just simply using this light, plugging it in, and then turning the lights off, making sure there's no, either you're doing it at night, or there's no sun or bright light coming through the environment, that's going to create a dark room. So what we'll do right now is we'll show you a dark room. Here we're in the dark room. We have our light safe yellow bulb plugged into a simple light fixture that we got at Home Depot. Now, if you don't want to buy a light fixture, you can plug it into a desk lamp or even above overhead incandescent fixture or a stand-up lamp incandescent fixture. This plugs simply into any incandescent bulb fixture. We have some shades over our windows or we're doing this at night so no light or bright whites, lights coming in, our doors shut, and we're in a controlled environment. So creating a screen print darkroom is not super hard. We don't have to have some crazy you know, room with all these special tools in it. With a simple bulb that you got in your kit, a light fixture to plug that into and putting some, you know, either some black plastic or some cardboard or a shade over the lit window or you know, shutting the doors, turning the lights off, we're now in a light safe room. Now for purposes of filming, what we're actually going to do is we're going to turn the lights back on but we're going to keep this light on to represent that we're in a light safe room. But so you can see better during the process, for the majority of what we're going to be doing, coding, prepping the screen, exposing, we are going to turn the lights on. Then we're going to turn them back off when we have to have a light safe area when we're actually going to rinse the screen out. So let's turn the lights back on and get to business. So we're keeping our light safe yellow bulb on to simulate the darkroom environment. But we have the bright light, white lights on so you guys can see what's going on. The next step we're, we're going to do is when you get your emulsion, we have to sensitize it. So this emulsion does not come sensitized, and we can actually open it up in a UV light lit area. So actually in the light that we're in right now, as we open this emulsion, it's going to be safe until we add in the Diazo sensitizer. Right now we're going to be using the Ryanet WBP dual cure emulsion. Dual cure means that we're mixing in a light sensitive sensitizer into the emulsion 
WVP stands for water-based plastisol. So that means this emulsion is, is, works for water-based ink, which you get in your kit. You actually get water-based ink in your kit, or plastisol ink. Plastisol ink, as you'll learn, is more user-friendly. It doesn't dry out in the screen. So you might switch to plastisol ink down the road, and this emulsion will work fine. So as you learn to use it, it works for either inks. It comes unsensitized. So what we're going to do is we're going to add sensitizer to that. Now, once again, we're in a light-safe environment. We're going to take this and add this one half full of distilled water. So you don't want to use tap water. We're actually going to be using some bottled water. I'm a little thirsty, so I'm going to take a swig first. And then we're going to add this half full. Now be very careful when you're handling this. This is very powdery. So once we put that half full, we'll put the lid on, and then we'll shake it up. Now, we're actually going to be using an ink spatula. This is a great tool. It's available on our website. It doesn't come in the kit, but once again, a great tool to use for stirring the emulsion. If you don't have this, you can use a putty knife. You can even use a, a dinner knife or a spoon, but you, using a knife is a little bit better. Your emulsion cap actually has some residue or leftover emulsion on this. Because this isn't sensitized, we're actually going to take it and scrape this, the remainder of this, into the container. Now, emulsion actually comes off very easily with warm water. So if you get it on your countertop, just take a warm rag, wipe it down. If you let it dry, though, it doesn't come off well. So clean it up immediately and it comes off fine. Same thing with your whatever you know, utensils or anything that you're using to scrub it, cover this. So once this is all shaken up, we're going to go ahead and dump this in. And if you notice, the emulsion starts out bright pink, and this is a dark brown. So we're going to stir it up now. You do want to be very careful when you're stirring it up. You don't want to stir too aggressively. The, the harder you stir, the more air you mix into it as well. Now once this is stirred, you want to let it sit for about two hours in order for the air bubbles to come out of the emulsion. Once again, we are in a light safe environment, remember, because if we were in a UV lit environment, we would actually be pre-exposing this emulsion right now, which would be very bad for business because it would make the emulsion not work once we go to expose it on the screen. So you're going to want to stir it up so it's consistent and uniform in color. So you don't want to see a lot of air bubbles in it, and you also don't want to see a lot of streaks in it. And you want to take your you know, utility tool, whatever you're using, a wood paint stick works good too, a knife, these ink spatulas work amazing, great investment for cleaning up ink too, and available on the website. So now, we're all stirred up. We're going, we're working the edge of the emulsion to make sure that all the emulsion is off the edge, but we're very consistent in color. And emulsion, as you can see, is rather runny. So that's where the trick of controlling it comes into. We'll take all the rest off the knife, and then once again with a nice, just simple warm rag with some warm water on it, we'll clean that off. We'll also clean the countertop off immediately. So it ripes right off with warm water, but if you let it sit, no good. So as you can see here, bubbles coming up. Those air bubbles are coming out of the emulsion. If you want to put the lid, just crack it open and let those air bubbles come up and out of the emulsion before we go to coat the screen. Once we've allowed this to sit, we're going to go ahead and coat the screen. The screen's been degreased already. You don't want to coat an undegreased screen. The screen's dry. You don't want to coat a wet screen or in a light safe environment because this is unexposed emulsion. And you want to a stable place to hold your screen so you can coat it easily with your scoop coater. So what we're actually going to do is we're going to take our platen, this is an extra platen which we'll discuss later, and push it against the back of the kitchen counter. You can use, use a 2 by 4 you can use something like even a big book would work fine. And we're going to take this screen and we're going to push it against the cover like this so I can actually take and put some pressure against it. Now we also have a very easy to use screen coating stand. So if you're doing a lot of screens, check it out on the website. You search in screen coating stand. It holds the screen in place automatically for you. This is your scoop coater. 
This is the tool that we're going to use to coat your screen. It has two sides, a sharp side and a round side. This allows a very sharp and thin coat of emulsion to go on the screen. This puts more emulsion on the screen. Before you use your scoop coater, you want to take a rag with some clean water, wipe it out, and then dry it out. It is a little bit dirty from shipping, so you want to make sure to clean it out nice and good so that you're not taking some clean emulsion, clean screen, and then putting in a dirty scoop coater. Next, we're going to fill the scoop coater up about a third full with emulsion. So we'll take the emulsion and simply fill it into the scoop coater. You can put more emulsion in than that, but if you're only coating one screen, you really don't need to. Once again, because emulsion cleans up great with water, we're going to go ahead and take a warm rag and clean that up. If you keep your workspace clean, it, does, it is a lot easier to control long term. So if you notice we spilled a little bit of emulsion right here, just take a rag right now, clean it right up. If we let it sit, it's going to make a mess later on. So as you can see right here, it's got a little bubbles from the pour, so we can actually simply work it back and forth to get those bubbles out. We shouldn't see many bubbles in that emulsion. A third of our scoop coater is full. If you're going to be doing a lot of screens, you can fill it fuller than that. Now there's two sides of your screen. There's your shirt side, which is your flat side, and there is your ink side, which holds your ink. You always want to coat the shirt side of your screen first, the flat side of your screen second, and you always want to coat both sides of your screen. The reason why you want to coat both sides of your screen is you want to make sure that you encapsulate the screen mesh. So you take emulsion, coat on the outside, and then the inside. The reason why you coat the inside of the screen first is you push the emulsion to the shirt side. The shirt side is what holds the ink. Your squeegee then releases that ink onto the garment. So you don't want to coat the ink side of the screen first and the shirt side of the screen second. Shirt side first, screen side, I mean ink side second. Now once again, we have something holding our screen in place. We're going to be using two hands on our scoop coater, have good control over it, and we're going to be using the round side of, excuse me, the sharp side of the scoop coater, not the round side. Sharp side of your scoop coater. So if you look in and you can see what I'm doing here, you want to make sure that we're using a clean screen once again. Tilt the scoop coater up. You want a good amount of pressure on the scoop coater right now. You don't want to lax the pressure. It needs to be pressed firmly against the mesh. This mesh is tough. It can, it can take some pressure. So you see how it's, that emulsion is like kind of piled up or dammed up against the mesh right there. That's good. I like to tilt the scoop coater back slightly. Now, if you notice, my hands are in the outside positions of the scoop coater, holding it tight. Now, typically, it would actually be in front like this. So you can have it nice and straight, but since I'm going to show you guys, I'm going to sit, sit to the side a little bit. Now I'm going to tilt it back just slightly, not put too much emulsion on the screen, and to see what I'm doing. Now I'm going to put a lot of pressure on, and I'm going to take the scoop coater about a half an inch from the top of the screen. I start a half an inch from the bottom of the screen, and now once it's dammed up, take the scoop coater, and then coat the screen up to the top half inch. Now, let's show you guys one more time. And this time, I'm going, to, I'm going to step a little bit closer. Now, typically, you only want to coat the screen one-on-one, -on -one, but I'm just showing you guys again so you can see what I'm doing. So you should end up with a nice, even coat. Now, by stopping a half inch from the top, you actually let the scoop coater rest and let that emulsion slide back into the screen, you know, the scoop coater. Let the emulsion slide back into the scoop coater so you don't have a lot of residue on the top and the bottom. Now, you're never going to get a perfectly straight screen. Hey, maybe if you get really good, you'll get a perfectly straight screen, but the goal is not to get emulsion all over the place, right? So next, you put the screen on the inside. This is a little bit more difficult because you're going to have to dip the trough in, but same concept. Let that emulsion well up onto the screen mesh. Tilt it back slightly, and then straight on up with it, letting it stop about a half inch from the top. And you should see a nice, glassy, and smooth surface. Very nice, glassy, and smooth surface. This screen is now coated. Now, once again, coated in a light, safe environment. Next step is to let this screen actually dry. Now, you don't want to let the screen dry like this. If you let the screen dry like this, what you're actually going to be doing is you're going to be letting this emulsion now settle to the bottom of the screen. So you always want to let the screen dry in the position like it's going to be printing. 
Now we have our nicely coated screen. And once again, we're in a light safe room, right? And you're gonna let this dry on two pieces of wood. We're actually using our two ink containers. And we put the ink containers directly on the screen frame, not on the emulsion, because you want to keep this nice, smooth, and consistent. Now, if you let this dry just in a standard room environment like this, it's probably going to take a while. It could take a day. Emulsion likes dryness, and it likes air movement. So the optimal thing to do is actually take a fan, a small little desk fan or you know, a bedroom fan, and let it blow across the screen. If you're in a very humid place, you want to do this inside, and if you're in an extremely humid place, you might want to think about getting a dehumidifier because if there's water still left in the screen, that emulsion, when we go to expose it, it's not going to want to release from the mesh. It's not going to want to hold onto the mesh. So the emulsion needs to dry. So optimal humidity would be under 40%. Now, in just a standard room like this, it's not humid outside that much right now, it would probably dry without a fan in about a day. With a fan over it, it'd probably dry in four hours. Now, if you want to speed things up again, you can actually get the blow dryer out and just you know, blow dry over the screen. This is not optimal because you want to give it some not, not a lot of forced air, but you could take this out and blow dry over the screen. The screen needs to stay in a dark environment during this process. So you want to make sure you put a sign on the door or you do it at night. A lot of people coat the screens at night and let them dry overnight with a, a small fan on and come back the next day. But if it's in a lit environment, if somebody comes in this room right now and flips on the lights, your screen's done ski. So once the screen's coated, we can store them doesn't have in, in a way that by using like a thick black trash bag, go to the store and get those thick four mil black trash bags. We can actually store them in that location so we can store them in a lit room or in a closet or something like that. But for this right now, light safe environment, let it dry with a, a fan blowing across it so that you can touch the screen and you, your hands don't stick to it. While you're in the dark room, you want to clean out your emulsion from your scoop cutter because you can save this. So while it's wet, put your glove on and then take one finger and scoop that emulsion back into the scoop coater, saving as much emulsion as possible. This emulsion, once mixed, is good for roughly three months. If you keep it in a cool environment, like a fridge, it will last longer. So what we recommend doing is actually dating your emulsion once you mix it. So actually take a pen and write the date you mixed it. Because if it gets older than three months and you have to start having problems with exposing your screen, what will happen is your emulsion will not, not work as well. It will take longer to expose. It will start to break down or not release all the way in your image. So you want to make sure that you keep it in a cool dark area. You keep the lid shut all the way and you write the date on it so you know when it's starting to expire and you can reorder some so you're not fr freaking out and needing an extra air some emulsion. So we've taken that in, we're now shutting the lid to seal it. We're going to go ahead and put it in the fridge. Now if you are putting it in the fridge, you want to make sure that you're putting it in a fridge that's not super, super cold. If the emulsion freezes, it's done as well. So put it in a cool fridge. Uh, you don't have to put it in a fridge. You can definitely keep it in your screen print room. It just won't last as long. So keep it in a fridge will make it last longer, but don't let it freeze because it will ruin it if it freezes. So now you have your emulsion. We can take it in a sink using warm water. And you can use a little bit of emulsion remover, but you can just use some simple warm water here and a dirty rag. And then just scrub out the emulsion. Now this stuff will stain as well, once again, so you do want to make sure that you're either doing this like in a utility sink and or cleaning things extremely well. As you can see, it's kind of got a yellow stain to it. So it, if I'm like cleaning my countertop, I can actually see some yellowness there and I want to make sure to, to take that emulsion off immediately, take it out of the sink immediately so that if we're using like an area that's not specifically for screen printing or cleaning stuff, it doesn't ruin it. But it comes off great with warm water, both on countertops, on tools, in your scoop coater, and on your hands, even on your clothes. So if you spill the stuff on your clothes, using warm, putting it through a wash cycle before it dries out or just taking it out with a warm, dry rag works wonders. So as you can see, just cleaning this out real nice. 
Um, you do not want to clean this with a sharp object. You want to make sure that you're cleaning it with either your hands or a nice soft towel or paper towel. So once this is all cleaned up, we're going to go ahead and let this dry. You want to keep the integrity of your edges of your scoop cutter very good. If it gets nicks, those nicks will transfer to your screen. So you want to make sure that when you let this dry, let it dry in a towel or let it dry in a position that the, it's not going to actually be touching right here. Because if it touches and if it scrapes, then you, know, you could damage the scoop coat or you have to get a new scoop coat. They're not super expensive, but let them dry in, in a way that, and let them store in a way that you're not touching the edge. So you're keeping that edge very nice and sharp. Next step of the process, creating your film positive. So we're actually going to jump into the computer, create our artwork, which then we'll print our film. We'll show you how to do that. Let's jump into the computer now. Okay, here comes the fun part. Let's talk about artwork. Let's talk about how to get the concepts, whether you create them from scratch, take them from the internet, somebody brings them to you, and get them on a t-shirt so you can be happy or make your customer happy. So we're going to focus on very simple designs with this particular video and with this particular kit. Now keep in mind this is a starter kit, so that's the reason we're focusing on simple designs. You want to be able to walk before you run. So instead of doing very complex stuff, we're going to show you a little bit of how to do more complex stuff a little bit later on. We're really going to make it simple because as you get good at simple stuff, you will be able to expand to more complex stuff. So whether you're creating simple, silly ideas like you see here, or maybe your own clothing line, or taking hand-drawn artwork, or making a shirt for your band, or a movie poster, or just something quirky and simple with some text and a saying or something clever. Whatever you're doing, let's show you how to create that artwork using the simple artwork programs available to most screen printers as you're starting out and the artwork sources. So first before we jump into the artwork programs let's talk about art construction. There are essentially two different types of art. There is what's called raster art and there's called vector art. Now raster arts like a JPEG, a TIFF, a bitmap. These are all raster artwork and the way raster artwork is created is it's actually created by using pixels. So right here we see some raster artwork. This is actually online, live online right now. Now typically, let's preface this by anything that you see online is, is a raster artwork. As you see right here, the file type is a JPEG. That is a raster piece of artwork. That means it's comprised of pixels. So if we zoom in, we can actually see the pixels. You can see the little chunks of information. And the pixels are, are created and defined as far as resolution by dots per inch. Meaning, the more dots per inch, the higher resolution the image. Most images that you see on the internet are going to be 72 dpi or dots per inch. And that's going to equate to a very low quality image. Now, that's what raster is. It's pixels, and you can never get a better result than what you start out with. So if you start out with a 72 dpi image, which is a lower quality image, and if you're looking for images on Google, you need to keep that in mind. Most images that you see on the internet or that you search on Google Images, they're not going to produce very good quality t-shirts. So either you want to search for higher resolution images or vector images. So the optimal resolution for screen printing would be more around the 300 dpi range. Literally four or five times as detailed as the image that you see here. But if you vectorize your image or if you get a vector image, you don't have to worry about that. Because what vector does is it cleans everything up and it turns it into essentially a mathematic equation using lines and curves. So vector images, you can actually take a 1 by 1 inch image and make it a 10 by 10 foot image if you want to once it's in vector format and dealt with in a vector program. So raster images are dealt with in, in a raster program. Now the most popular raster program out there on the market right now is called Photoshop. There's also a free version of that called GIMP. So what, whether you're using Photoshop, Photoshop Elements, or GIMP, or, or another raster-based program, it's going to allow you to do some stuff and create basic 
designs and artwork, but it's going to limit the quality of that design because of the way it handles the information. So unless you're working with very high resolution artwork, you're going to be getting jagged lines. A vector program like Illustrator or CorelDRAW actually takes that raster artwork and will vectorize it or will deal with a pre-vectorized image. And once you're in vector format, you're in a much better controllable environment. The quality of this image totally dictates the quality of your screen. If you don't have a good quality image, you're not going to have a good quality screen. So let's go back to that smiley face design and illustrate what we're talking about. Now as you're starting out, besides vector and raster, there's also different types of the artwork. There is a spot color artwork and there is a gradient artwork. Now a spot color artwork has no shading or gradients in it. So as you see right here, this is a spot color piece of artwork. This is a spot color piece of artwork. This is a spot color piece of artwork. This is not a spot color piece of artwork. This is a gradient piece of artwork. Because of the depth of that gradient, we have to use what's called half tones, and we'll talk about half tones a little bit more in order to create that. In order to create half tones, you have to have some special software and a little bit different of a film output printer. So we're going to stick with spot color, meaning there's no gradient or shading in that design. Now this is all the text typically is spot color, most logos, and we will actually show you how to turn photographs like the Green Day poster that you saw earlier into spot color too. So you can actually do a lot of cool stuff with spot color and turn a lot of two color designs into a one color piece of artwork. Right here we have a couple smiley faces. So let's actually take this smiley face and create it on a t-shirt like you see here. Now, if you are looking for images in Google, you do want to make sure that you're dealing with uncopyrighted images, especially if you're going to be selling the artwork. It's best to use an image source or buy what's called clip art. Now, clip art's available. It's actually available on our website. You can buy hundreds of vectorized clip art images, actually thousands of vectorized clip art images, very, very cheap. So you don't have to go searching around for stuff and instead of investing your time searching across the internet for an image that might be royalty free, you can 100% sure know it's royalty free, pay a lot less per image and have access to it at your fingertips. So check out the vector and the artwork products on our artwork page of the website in order to find more information on how to make give yourself a better arsenal for a screen printing. But if you are looking for images, you want to look for higher resolution images. So notice here on the larger than size, you can actually select a higher resolution image and this is going to give us a much better piece of art to start out with. The lower resolution images won't clean up as easily. So here we have our image. We're going to go ahead and download this. And then we're going to use both Photoshop and CorelDRAW and or CorelDRAW also kind of coincides with Illustrator, so Illustrator, CorelDRAW vector programs, Photoshop, a raster program. We're going to show you how to do this type of image in both programs. Now here we have the two images. We can actually see the image resolution size by clicking on the image and going to image and image size and viewing that this is a 22 by 22 inch image, 72 dpi. Now what that means is this is a very large image and if we actually wanted to take this down to let's say 10 inches, we can actually increase the resolution because we're changing the size, we're taking the size down, meaning the resolution can go up. However, if you start out with a, a 10 by 10 inch image and it's 72 dpi, if you expand it now to a 20 by 20 inch image, it's going to be half of 72 dpi. This image right here is a much smaller image. And if we see this one, it's 5 by 5, 72 dpi. So let's see. Let's try to do the opposite here. Look what happens if we actually take this image and make it a 10 by 10 inch image. Now it's actually degraded the quality of the image even more. So if we zoom in here, we can actually see what pixels mean. Here you see 72 dpi pixels. Are the edges sharp? No, they're not sharp. Right here, because the image is 150 dpi, on this side of the equation, we see a much better image. However, even though this image is better, you can still see these are not solid lines. Now, keep in mind, this is a spot color image, so it does not have any gradients in it. And it's a two color image as well. 
So we can actually use a tool that's called what's a, it's called a threshold tool, and a threshold tool will take all the other gradient information out of the image and or lighter colors. So under image and image adjustments in Photoshop, you can use a threshold tool to turn this into a one color image. So now we have a one color image using black ink or black ink on a yellow shirt, let's say. So we would create this image. In fact, we could even take the smiley face out of the equation. In fact, we could actually just take the smiley face base part of this image and just by using our crop tool here, or image selection tool, we can go ahead and cut this or copy this into a new layer. So now we would just have that one color image right then and there for printing. Now, no matter what color of ink you're printing with, you're going to create what's called a film positive. We'll talk more about film positives. But a film positive is a black ink on a clear transparent background. So typically whatever you see on the computer screen should be black on a white background. If you see black on a red background or black on a yellow background and we tried to print a film, you would not only print the black part of the image, you would also print the shirt. So you want to be able to take the black part of the image out. And by using that threshold tool that we just showed you, even if you're using a lower resolution image, you can actually turn any image into a single color. So once again, go to image and image adjustments and then threshold. And once again, you see this go down to a one color image. Now, you have the ability to select how much of that one color you want. You can actually select the whole entire t-shirt and turn the whole thing black or just the smiley face. Now, we have just the smiley face here, but look how low quality this is. It's not a good quality image because it is a raster image. Right here, we have a better quality image, but still a raster image. If you are doing a two color piece of artwork, you can actually also come in here and separate this by either using this little magic wand tool and selecting the yellow in the design and selecting layer via copy and that will copy that into a new layer. You can also select the black of course and or just certain selections of black. So let's say I just want to select that eye. I can hit shift and select that eye and shift and select the mouth and select layer via copy. And this copies this whole image into a new layer. So now we have just the black smiley face on a transparent background. So this is the one kind of nice thing about Photoshop is it, built, it gives you the ability to kind of break apart images. And if you use higher quality resolution images, there's no reason why you can't use Photoshop to do lots of cool stuff. In fact, even with this Green Day image, if we use that threshold tool, we could take all the gradients out of this image and turn this into a simple one color print. Now, you'll actually see a lot of band shirts looking like this using that threshold tool. It's kind of a cool rock and roll punk rock look. However, the one thing that you have to realize is whatever you're dealing with here is only going to be as good as you start out with. So if you are starting out with a new image in Photoshop, you're going to open up a new window and it's going to ask you the resolution size of that window. Always put a higher resolution. Always put 300 dpi to begin with. And you always want to work in RGB mode. CMYK mode is specifically for four color process printing, which is more of an advanced style of screen printing. And as you're starting out, using RGB mode will create better and darker images for you. But let's say we're going to create a 10 by 10 inch image we wouldn't want to create that image in 72 dpi. It's typically the default setting in Photoshop, so you want to make sure that you plug in 300 dpi here. So once you plug this in, it's going to open up a new canvas. Now the cool thing about Photoshop is as you drag images onto this canvas, it automatically converts them into 300 dpi. So I'm going to drag the screen day image on there. And you'll see the image actually got a lot smaller, but now it's 300 dpi. So it's a black image on a white background, meaning that it's ready to output our films, screen printable, because it is a spot color image. We took all the gradients out of that, meaning that we don't have to use half tones or a rip, which we'll discuss later. And we can know that it's higher quality. Look what happens when we pull over the smiley face, however. The smiley face actually gets a lot smaller because it was sm smaller to begin with. So this is 300 dpi right here. 
But if you really zoom in or if you wanted to take this and expand it by using our free transform tool, we notice that it automatically starts to degrade and then you get those edges back. So using Photoshop, you do need to make sure to use high quality images. Now you can also insert text here, of course. So if you're inserting text on this image, you do want to make sure that once again you're working with a 300 dpi canvas, but I can actually take some text, choose my font, so the text is in 300 dpi, and because the text kind of works in vector format in this particular artwork program, you can actually see the difference here. So the text is in higher resolution, 300 dpi, the background is in 300 dpi, but because we drew the smiley face, you can see the difference in all these images. So the text right here, very high quality, very, very high quality in fact. The background image that was thresholded actually has pretty sharp lines. And then the actually smile face is very low quality. So you can see it is in fact, when we cut that image out, there was still some of that yellow left behind. So if you're using this type of image, you definitely want to make sure that you're using high resolution. And then if you're using text in Photoshop, start on that 300 dpi canvas. Couple of things as far as using Photoshop, and we're gonna jump back into Photoshop when we talk about film output, is when you're opening up your image, you typically wanna see your rulers, so we typically ask to show rules, rulers, that way we know how large our image is and where the center crop marks are on the image. So that way it will allow us to take a center line, center it in the exact center of the Im this image, and we can work relatively off that. We're going to talk a lot about center lines throughout the course of this DVD, so pay attention to centering your image, because it's very important when you get to actually print your films and when you get to expose your screen. Photoshop. Once again, it's a pretty good tool to use, especially if you're designing your own artwork. The, the tools that I actually use the most in Photoshop for screen printing are going to be the following. Obviously, you want your text tool because you're going to be opening and using a lot of text designs. You can go and download hundreds of fonts to download into Photoshop by simply putting them in your font folder of your Windows documents. You can also use, next would be that magic wand tool. Magic wand tool is great for both selecting certain parts of your image and you can actually select your tolerance up here so you can actually choose to select more of the image or less of the image and by selecting contiguous that means I'm going to select either all the black in the image or just the contiguous black so if I select just contiguous black you can notice that I'm only selecting the one eye at a time versus if you deselect contiguous you select all the black so that's a cool tool not only for the image selection part and breaking the images apart because I can actually select that I can select the yellow and I can delete it. So I can actually delete that part of the image. In fact, I can select this outer design and I can delete that too. So I could actually delete that part of the image if I select the contiguous and delete that. So you can do some cool stuff with Photoshop using that magic wand tool. Also, magic wand tool allows you to do what's called a channel separation. So if instead of uh, left clicking and I right click, I can use what's called a color range. And this, if you use the magic wand tool, once again the pointer tool here, you can take apart the image and sele select different parts of color in that image. So right here, you can actually see if I click on the black in the image, it takes out the black. Now, this is a channel function, meaning it doesn't separate into layers, and it will automatically, first of all, select and automatically default to taking out the negative. Now, are we creating a screen print negative or are we creating a screen print positive? You'll notice that they're called screen print positives, meaning that we want to put the negative onto the t-shirt. So, if we're going to invert that, we would actually see the design that we're creating. So, if I want to click on black or if I want to click on yellow, it will select all the yellow. And then you can choose, kind of like the threshold tool, how much yellow you want to select. So, this is kind of cool, not the fact that it would actually separate this yellow. We could go later via copy and you can see some of the black there, but you can also, with this tool, select a new channel. So, in Photoshop, you work in both layers, which you see right here. You always want to see your layers tab open, 
and channels. Channels deal with more of the color values of the program and are used a little bit more by advanced printers or artwork users in Photoshop. So if I right click once again and select color range and select that yellow, that's going to put the marching ants, is what we call it, all the way around the image. And we right click and save selection and call it our yellow channel. We notice that we still only have one layer over here, but we do have an extra channel. We have RGB, because you always want to work in RGB format, right? And we have our yellow, which automatically converts it to black. Which this is kind of cool using this tool, because if you select just this channel to output, the nice part about this is it's already in black format. Now using the channel function will only work if you're using a postscript or rip printer. If you try to rip this to a standard inkjet Epson printer or a standard inkjet printer, it doesn't like to rip channels. Now, the way to get around that is you can actually go up here to the right hand corner and you can use a function called split channels, which takes all these channels and splits them into new documents. So, for instance, now we have that black image in its new channel and we can print it directly to that Epson printer. However, it does take a few extra steps and sometimes just using the layer separation function like we showed you at the beginning. My next favorite tool is called the threshold tool, which we've already discussed. The threshold tool takes out all the color. I definitely love that tool. Also, you have the eraser tool, which is cool because you can erase certain parts of an image. So I can come out here and I can erase the outline of this design. You have the lasso tool, which we've already showed, so you can select certain parts of the design. And you have some different painting tools and brushes and you know different types of effects as well. But Photoshop is cool if you're breaking images apart, if you're designing images from scratch, if you're using some artistic style of photographic images. The thing we teach in our classes is Photoshop, think photograph. If you're doing a spot color design like this, like we see right here with the smiley face, this is more of a vector style of design. This is a photographic design. This is a vector style of design. And because we're working in a raster format, as you saw before, we're not going to get a high quality vector image. So if you're going to work with a program starting out, it's definitely a little bit easier to start out with a vector program like CorelDRAW. So if I import the same exact smiley face into CorelDRAW, we notice that it, that it imports actually as a JPEG. Now, it doesn't import any higher quality as it did with Photoshop not one bit but check this out we can actually go to trace bitmap and do what's called a quick trace or an outline trace of a logo and it will actually trace this and vectorize it for us so look at the eyes here this is the cleaned up vectorized image and this is the raster image a complete world of difference which is awesome because now we have an image that is actually screen printable. We can actually even go in here and choose how many colors we want to screen print with. So let's take this back down to full size. Now we're dealing with a two color image here. We have black and yellow. In fact, we might only want to print black. So we don't actually have, we can either leave it all the different colors or we can actually downgrade these colors and choose I only want to separate this into a three color image. Now you have to keep in mind that the background sometimes counts as a color so you don't want to take out all the color typically. So right now we have a two color or a three color image. Now once we hit OK this will actually take us back into CorelDRAW as a vectorized image. So this is a vector image now. We start out with a raster, and now we have a nice, easy to use vector piece of artwork. However, the another cool thing about CorelDRAW is you don't actually have to separate the image. All you have to do is color the image. So right here we have a grouped image. Let's go ahead and ungroup this. And what it will allow us to do is it will allow us to break this image apart. So see how I can take the eye out? Well, instead of having to separate it, we color it. Now, we use what's called a Pantone solid coated color to color it. So we're going to go ahead and show you how to open that. You go to our, your color palette and you go to Pantone solid coated. So open up another palette, go to open palette, and then choose so first you go to Window, then you go to Color Palette, 
and you don't want to use your default color palette. You want to show more, more palettes here. And under more palettes, it's going to give you the option for all these different types of Pantone palettes. The reason we're using Pantone colors is that's what we actually screen print with, is all the colors of ink that you're using is some type of Pantone color. So we can use that same color to recognize the color in Photoshop or CorelDRAW. So we're going to use solid coated color and we're going to show this color palette which is actually already selected. So we're going to open that up again and we can see all the different colors in this palette starting out with darks going to pastels. Now once this is selected we can select this different area of the design see that area, see this area? And we can go ahead and choose a black or red or whatever color we want to color that. So see how I select black right there and it changes that to black? If I select this and I can go ahead and select black right there, it changes it to black. Well, you also want to show under your window your document palette. So under your window, you want to show color palettes and show your document palette. That's going to show what colors are active in the actual palette. So what we're doing now is we're going to close all of our other palettes except for our Pantone solid coated palette, which is the, what, the color palette that we use to color the image, and our document palette. So the document palette is cool because you don't have to weed through all these, these colors again. You can just simply select the colors that you're using in the design. So as you can see, my eyebrows are now, my eyes are all black. And my mouth, I can also select as black. Now, let's say we wanted to make this a two color image we can select the yellow and now change this to a Pantone yellow. Now let's go with a little bit brighter one so we can actually see a little bit more of the design there. It's not brighter. There we go. So now we have a black, a Pantone yellow, and then we have the outline which I can either delete, which I just did, or keep there. So I'm going to go ahead and keep it there and show you why it's kind of cool to, to see that still there because we didn't color that palette. What we're going to do now is under our print menu, we're going to show you what all that coloring just did. So in your print preview mode, you have a couple different tabs up here. You have color, you have composite, you have layout, prepress, and then it will tell you if, if you have images or not. Now, under composite or under color, we have two options. We have either print composite or print separations. Print composite means it's going to print what's on the computer screen. Print separations means it's going to print the actual color separations in your design. So it will actually color separate the design for you. And I can select the black and the yellow that I printed with. And I can actually see these separated out. So all we had to do is, now this is a CMYK image, we should have opened this in RGB mode, we would have dealt with the colors a little bit better, but because we just selected the yellow and the black, we now have our yellow and we have our black. So we didn't have to do any separations at all. In fact, it's ready to output. We have one plate here, and we have the next plate, already color separated, already ready to go. We could do a two color design, or we can also just simply keep it simple and do a one color design. So CorelDRAW is really cool because instead of having to go through that separation process, all we have to do is go open a Pantone color palette and color the design. and Color it the way we want in a vector format. So one thing that we do recommend is if you, you can actually get CorelDRAW as what's called a expansion package or an upgrade program. You don't have to go out and buy CorelDRAW as the full version. So if you don't have CorelDRAW yet, or if you don't have an artwork program, very important, don't buy the full version because you can actually work by working with Ryanet, we already packaged this with your screen printing package, quote unquote, and so we can sell you a special upgrade program that allows you to get a very good price on the software itself instead of paying full price for it or retail price for it. Oh, unfortunately, we don't have anything like that worked out with Adobe yet, but you can, you know, Adobe is a lot more expensive of a product, but it's more powerful because it's more geared towards doing lots of other stuff other than just screen printing. CorelDRAW also has what's called Photo Paint, which is kind of a very dumbed down version of Photoshop, but it can do some of that cool stuff that Photoshop was doing by dealing with those images and photographs. CorelDRAW 
is vector. So this is a raster image. It is a photograph. To vectorize this image, you're going to either print with a ton of colors or you're going to crash your computer because this type of image is very, very difficult to vectorize. So you can open up Photo Paint by simply selecting Edit That Map, and I'll show you how to do that. So let's say we import that picture of Green Day here into CorelDRAW. So let's go ahead and import that picture. Well, we can just click that image and hit Edit Bitmap, or Bitmap right there, right by Trace Bitmap, and that will convert this image into a Photo Paint file. We can go right up to Image, use our Transform function, and use our Threshold tool. So you want to select the bi-level threshold, which will take all the other color out of the image, and make this a spot color image, the same way Photoshop does. So there are some tools that you can actually use in CorelDRAW, and PhotoPaint comes as a part of CorelDRAW. So CorelDRAW is a very powerful program, plus it has this photo functionality in it. Not quite as powerful as Photoshop, but combined two for the price, you really can't beat it. And if you're looking for an artwork program and going to invest any money, we definitely recommend investing it wisely, and CorelDRAW is a great investment for that. Once again, going through the workflow process, we're going to open up either a vector artwork or we're going to vectorize the piece of artwork. So here's what I mean by opening a vector artwork. This artwork was actually created in a vector format, so this is already vectorized. And in fact, we can zoom in here and we can see that this is nice and vectorized, ready for output. Now you can also see that this is multiple colors, so what we need to do is if we want to either output this, we have two options. One, we can color it all the same color, or two, we can just print composite. So let's go ahead and center this to screen, and I can either just go in here into my print function and print it all out at once by printing my, under my color mode, print instead of printing separations, we're going to print composite, which will print everything out at once, or what I would recommend doing is I could highlight this image by using my selection tool right up here and highlighting the whole image and then finding that Pantone black right up there that we already used or in our Pantone black and our uh, Pantone solid coated color palette and then changing that entire image to black. And so that's what I just did is I just highlighted that whole image, changed everything to Pantone black, and now we don't have to worry about it. Once everything is converted into Pantone Black, we can go to our print preview mode again, and now we can see that under separations, if I, we select our black separation, everything is there, ready to output the film with that specific color because we already colored that. Now, with CorelDRAW, you can do a lot of stuff with text, and text stays in vector format, so I can make this text as big or as small as I want, which is awesome. So you have full range of text. You also can do stuff with text like curving and different types of effects with text. In fact, if you go to our YouTube channel and search CorelDRAW, you will see tons of videos, dozens, literally dozens of videos that show you how to deal with artwork and text in CorelDRAW. You can also do some stuff with you can also do some stuff like putting out outlines around vector text. So let's say we can use our outline pen and we can actually select outlines and we can select the outline color. So once again, if we're going to be using palettes, we want to use our solid coated palette. So we want to make sure that we're using the same palette. In fact, we can simply go over here. Let's say we want to select a red outline. We can select the red specifically from our Pantone palette or select right in here the solid coated palette. Now we have a two color, you know, a black image with a, a red outline, which is really cool because now if we go to separations, now if we go to separations in our print preview screen, we can actually see that we have the black, which is the image that we started out with, and we have that outline in perfect registration already colored. So if we're doing two color artwork, especially going into the future, it's simply just like painting your artwork the right colors that you want to screen print with. Now the one thing about using Pantone solid coated colors is, you know, if you take a look at this red, it's not like super vibrant. So you have to make sure that you have to make sure that you don't take the color on the screen super literal because literally we could color this black and red, but I could put purple through the screen if I wanted to. The color typically, I mean, in the end of the game, it's dictated by what color of ink you put through the screen. So you don't have to worry about getting the color spot on on the computer screen. It's a nice representation to see for yourself and to show your customers. So there's lots of cool stuff that you can do here in Corel. 
both as far as actual design and vector and on the raster side of the equation. Now we typically teach customers to do what you're best at. So instead of having to vectorize stuff and clean it up all the time, you can actually for a very reasonable price get this stuff done professionally very well for you. So for instance, this website called Copy Artwork, we've done a special partnership with Copy Artwork and Ryan to give you one half off your first order and then great pricing on all your other orders. And what Copy Artwork does is they take bad images like this and they clean them up very nicely. Here's just some examples of stuff they've done. So you take very, very, very low resolution images which would be very hard to clean up and they vectorize them extremely good and you can even do, they can do some amazing detail. So we're talking literally hand-drawn artwork right here turned into very nice looking vector artwork. And they do it for cheap too, like way, way cheaper than you could do it. So check out copyartwork.com because you want to spend your time printing shirts. If you're not printing shirts and you're doing this professionally, then you're not making money, right? You're making money when you're printing shirts. So by partnering with somebody like this that does vector, really kicking vector designs quick and easy, as you're you know, taking in more artwork and doing more stuff, it's going to be a much more effective use of your time. Now, we do realize that as you're starting out using this kit, most of the stuff you're probably going to be testing and creating on your own. So taking in images from Google or just creating funky sayings and Obviously, if you're creating it either in high resolution format or working it with in 300 dpi format in Photoshop or you know vectorizing it yourself or using vector text in CorelDRAW, then you don't have to worry about it. It's already going to be sharp, it's already going to be clean. And by using those either of those tools in the right parameters, when I'm talking about right parameters, that's Photoshop and high resolution. And what's the resolution again? It's 300 dpi, or CorelDRAW in a vector format and vector text then we can actually create some really cool images on our own without having to rely on you know, even outsourcing the cleanup of it. The thing about art that you have to realize is smile. Don't take it too serious. Just try stuff out. Try simple words. Try simple stuff out to begin with. Black text on a white background or a black image on a white background printed through your printer, which we're actually going to show you right now because that's going to allow you to actually see the magic happen, see those designs that you created or the saying that you came up with go onto a t-shirt. And when you're excited about that, when you're not worried about spending all this time learning CorelDRAW or learning Photoshop, you're actually going to want to learn these programs more. It's a process learning these programs. You know, to be honest with you guys, I'm teaching you how to use CorelDRAW and you might see me clicking through it real fast and easy, but I've only been using it for like a year or two. And in fact, when I did my first video on Corel, I used it for less than 20 hours. It's not that hard of a program to use, especially as you get familiarized with it and you're incented to use it by creating cool artwork that looks awesome on t-shirts. In fact, there's a program that Roundnet's made for CorelDRAW called Design Lab that takes clip art, artwork, and what's awesome, clip art templates, adds special effects, text, and separations all into one to make CorelDRAW super fast and easy for you. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. The image that we see right here, we can actually take this and we can generate our color separations. I can select the two colors that I want to separate, which are black and yellow, and we've seen it separate already into our outline and our center. So this program will actually do color separations for you automatically within CorelDRAW. It also does a lot of cool stuff, like let's say we want to check out the templates. So we can go to the art, and we can go to the templates. And you can keyword search any template you want. So let's look for, let's say, soccer. And let's say we like this template right here. We like this soccer template, or you know, let's say our school likes this particular soccer template. We can either place in the current document. Obviously, we don't want to do that. We're going to open up in a new document. The cool things about this is this is already color separated. In fact, we can just go to separations, we can go to color management, we can create our color palette by selecting the design, creating the color palette, and we can take down those colors. So let's say we wanted to only 
we can actually select all these different colors in this image and make it much simpler. So let's say I'm selecting these three blacks. I can simply hit replace and choose the green, let's say in our image right here. I'll just select my image selection tool there and choose the green. And then it changes them all to green automatically for us. And then once again, from here, we can simply generate color separations. And then you can see the Pantone colors, the gradients, if we want the gradients in there or not and then the Pantone red as well. So once again using center crop marks and then automatically generating those color separations for us. Back to the original image here we can actually select soccer and we can change it. So let's say we want to select we can apply a text swap and what's really cool here is you can actually go back to art and we can select a football. So instead of looking at clip art we're going to go ahead, I mean a template, we're going to go ahead and look at clip art and let's say we wanted to ch change this to a football, we can select football we have one of three pages of football designs to select from and let's change this to a helmet and like that I can swap that soccer bar out for a football and we can go through that color separation process, change all the colors so thousands of clip art images, thousands, uh, you know, hundreds of templates easily selecting comps. In fact, we can even go in here. We can put some cool distress filters over this stuff as well. So let's say we wanted to do some special effects like textures. We can go ahead and select some special, cool special effects to give it a kind of a, a cool raster effect. Let's go ahead and put that to the football as well. And you're left with a really cool looking design overall. And it takes away a lot of the hassle of having to develop something from scratch and already gives your customers something to start out with. So as you get down the road in Corel Draw, you want to speed your processes up, expand your repertoire as far as clip art goes, using a program like Design Lab to make that process a lot easier for you is a very, very you know recommended and really makes life simple. And by like making life simple it can really increase your profitability. So now the last section of this is to actually output the film. We're going to actually talk about going into film output now. So when you're outputting your film, depending on your page size, we need to output the film specific to the size of film we're printing with. Now the size of film that you've got in your kit is 8.5 by 11. That's typically the standard size of film that a standard inkjet printer would print with. It's a waterproof film, so if you bring it out of the pack right now and feel it, so I want you to go get the film out of the pack that you got it in. This is called a waterproof film, so there's two sides of this film. There's a waterproof or inkjet receptive side, and there's a plastic carrier sheet side. Different sides, they feel differently. The waterproof side is going to feel a little sticky. The inkjet, the inkjet carrier side, or the, the transparency carrier side, is going to feel smooth and slick like plastic. You want to print on the sticky side, which is the waterproof side. That will recept your inkjet film. So, first of all is, once again, you want to have your image colored. This image, we're going to go ahead and leave the outline there, even though we're not going to print it. So let's make it full size so we can see what we're doing. Now you also want to have your image centered and sized to your page. I typically re would recommend your page size either being the size of your image or slightly smaller. So here, right, right here, we have our image. It is 8.5 by 11. I actually am working on 8.5 by 11 canvas in CorelDRAW. So that's perfect. The only thing that's not perfect about it is there's two ways to set up registration marks and when you're using registration marks it's very important to use registration marks because if you're not using registration marks you don't know how to center your image so center registration marks are by far the most important and what's even also if you're doing you know more multiple colors you're using the center and the side marks so if you're using a 8.5 by 11 film and you're using the CorelDRAW registration marks which is placed in the print function, you wouldn't be able to place it because the film size is too big. So what you could do is you could shrink this down to let's say instead of 11 inches tall, 7 inches tall. The image is left to right, good, and top to bottom, centered. I can go into my print preview screen and once again I'm only printing the black so if I select my color separations, I only want to select the black, not the Pantone black, just the black right there. Under general, you can select whether to do this in landscape or landscape or standard portrait mode. Now, the way we have a Corel Draw set up right now is it automatically selects it for us. So it's automatically selecting us print this in portrait mode because it changes it. We can actually go in there and use 
printer default, which is more portrait, but as you notice, it kind of cuts the edges of our image out. So we're going to change that back to landscape. Now we already printed separations, we already selected what separations we're printing, we're seeing them over here on the right hand side of the screen. And because we're only doing a one color image, even if we're dropping down, we're not seeing any other options. Layout is in the center of the page, which is typically what I would recommend, and not shrinking this at all. If you're going to shrink your image, do it in the artwork program. Don't do it in the print preview program, because then the next time you go to print the image, it might not be the same size. Pre-press, that's where we add the registration marks. So you see right here we have registration marks. If you add your standard registration marks, it's going to add registration marks to the edge of your image. And we're going to expand this and show you it in print preview mode in a second. But you want to add center registration marks. So see how it adds two center marks here and two center marks here? Well, if we go back to landscape mode, we can see it adds center marks on the top and the bottom of our image. That's where we want to add them. Now, because this image is a little bit small for that, what we can do is we can actually add our separation marks manually. So you can add them in CorelDRAW like that if your canvas is big enough. Now, let's say we had a bigger printer, like an Epson 1100 printer. Well, instead of using 8.5 by 11, we can just buy some larger transparencies, and we can go to Printer Preferences and actually change that size. So I can go to Paper Size, and instead of, this is actually a laser printer, I can actually select a A3 size, which I know is a much larger size. It's 13 by 19. And now you see all the registration marks there. So if you have a larger printer with larger capacity, then you do have the ability to print those registration marks. And you know, the CorelDRAW registration marks are nice because it goes in the right spot every single time. If we don't have that ever, let's make this back into that larger into that larger canvas. So we're going to go ahead and change the page size back to 8.5 by 11. And then we're going to add registration marks manually. So first of all, we're going to draw a ruler. By drawing a ruler, we're going to take the left-hand side and draw a ruler to the center of our image. So this is 8.5, so we know that half of that is 4.5. So that's the center, that's the exact center of our image right there. Now, we can zoom in, make sure everything's centered out, and then we can actually come in here and draw these just little boxes essentially. So we're going to draw our little rectangle and we're going to draw one right up here. We're going to draw it right in the center of that line. And then we're going to, once again, I'm going to get rid of Design Lab over here. We're going to color that black. And then we're going to copy that. And then we're going to take that down to the bottom directly. So let's go through the setup once again. We're going to print separations and we're going to select just printing the black separation, of course. And then the layout is going to be in the center of the page. We don't need to select registration marks because we already did that. And then we are ready to go here. We can actually print with preview mode and see how the image is going to look. Now this, once again, is cutting pretty close to the edge, but we're just cutting it close enough so we should be fine. So from your print function, you can actually go to print preview and you can see everything that's going to print out. So right now I have my black selected. I wouldn't want to select that because that would actually send this to my printer along with this and along with this. So we would go ahead and print three pages when we really only need to print one. So that's a nice thing about seeing that print preview screen is you can actually go through every single thing that you're going to do. I just click shut down out of my print preview screen, back to my print screen. I can see that it's yelling me that I have one issue. It says it doesn't fit in the printable area. It goes outside that printable area. So I have a couple different options here. I can go back into my image. I can zoom out. So I'm going to see fit to page right here. And I can slightly shrink this. So I can shrink this image down just a little bit and then recenter this guy back up. Or I can maybe play around with the landscape mode. So let's talk about print settings. So in our print screen here, we have no issues, everything's centered out. We're only going to print our red, so I'm going to go back into separations. I'm going to, excuse me, we're only going to print our black, so I'm going to go back into separations. I only print my black, not my red, because I'm not going to do any two-color image. And right now we have this set up to a laser printer. Whatever printer you're printing with, the, set, the settings are pretty standard. And you're going to want to select the best quality settings as possible. Now, this is an inkjet film that you're printing with, it's waterproof film, so you want to use an inkjet printer, you don't want to use a laser printer. If you have a laser printer, buy some laser film, we have it available from our website, actually for less expensive than you can buy it at like 
you know, Office Max or whatnot. So we do have laser film available, but most people have an inkjet printer, so inkjet film is included in your kit. Now, let's go ahead and select an inkjet printer. We're going to select our Epson 1100 printer. Now, the Epson printer is a very common style of printer, but once again, most inkjet printers have very similar settings. And if we select our Preferences tab, this will actually allow us to go in and select different, different, different functions or settings in our document. Now, one setting to always keep in mind is you want to lay a lot of ink down. You have to have a very opaque transparency in order for that screen to expose good. So, when your printer is printing with text, it's not laying a lot of ink down. It's printing text. So what you want to do is you want to select the best quality photo settings possible on your printer. Now they're all called something different. You know, Epson uses best quality photo. HP uses something different. Lexmark uses something different. Brother uses something different. But the best photo or the best quality settings is going to lay down the most ink. Then you also want to select your paper type. The waterproof film is very, very similar to premium glossy photo paper and that will actually lay more ink down than using ultra premium photo paper or plain white paper so you want to select premium glossy photo paper next you want to select your size now we're today we're working with an 8.5 by 11 but for instance if you're getting an Epson 1100 printer which by the way is a great investment because it's a cheap printer and you can do larger images and in the future you can upgrade that to a rip or half tone compatible printer in all black format so it's a great printer now and in the future so if you're going to invest in an inkjet printer check out the 1100 once again available on the website but also available in a lot of other stores if you see it on sale pick one up get a great deal on it we encourage you to do so but one cool part about that is using those larger image sizes so you can actually use a 13 by 19 sheet of film on this printer select ok and look how much bigger our canvas size just became we can actually expand the format of that shirt a lot and have a lot of fun with it. So that Epson 1100 printer, once again, let's go through the settings. We're going to change this back to 8.5 by 11. Best quality photo, premium glossy photo paper. Then you can also change landscape mode if you want to, of course. And there you have it. So you have best quality photo, premium glossy photo paper is going to give you the best, most dense image on your, Im on your screen possible. Select OK. And then make sure that you're printing on what side of that transparency film. It's the sticky side. So you stick your sticky side face up. You don't have to do any layout things as far as inverting or doing anything different there. So you don't want to mirror or invert this image. We want to simply print it out the way we see it on the sticky side of the transparency film using best quality settings and if you have the paper setting that says photo glossy paper or premium glossy photo paper that's the photo setting that you want to use now you can try this out experiment with it especially if you have a different brand other than an Epson but an Epson printer is going to be your best bet the 1100 the newer version is the 1430 has a few more cartridges in it and there will be newer Epson photo printers coming out later on you know in the future and those are going to provide the best prints on this waterproof film that's pretty much it I mean you print your film and that the next step of the process is going to expose the screen which we're going to go back into the screen print area in our kitchen and do that however before you do we do that we've basically dealt with spot color designs we did not do anything with photographs so back to the photograph side of the equation and by the way if you're outputting films in Photoshop it's very very similar you're using the same print settings and basically you're lining everything up centering everything up the same way so just using that print preview screen to see what you're doing is also very important Illustrator doesn't have that print preview screen so Photoshop and Corel draw a little bit more user friendly for that functionality but pho photographic printing because it has these gradients and shades we can't differentiate an image by ex trying to expose a screen like this because your, f your screen, as you're exposing, it sees black and it sees clear. And that, that allows you to do a clear transparent transparency background. However, with a photograph, we have different shading. So what we're going to talk about right now is we're going to show you a quick commercial on AccuRip that will kind of expand your horizons in the future as you get more complex and you want to use like poster printing or even cool color printing like this in grayscale mode because you can actually do, let's say we can make this adjustment and desaturate, you can do a lot of cool images like this in just black and white with one screen. 
using Accurip. So Accurip is a cool program that automat automates the process for you in printing photographs in high color, in-depth gradient and shading. Check out this commercial now. Accurip, the most popular rip in the screen printing market. Silkscreenisupplies.com, the best place to get it from. But what does it do? A lot of people don't know what a rip is, especially if you're new to screen printing. Basically what a rip does is it takes a gradient scale and converts it into a half tone dot. So we're taking a look at the CMYK image. Let's take a look at the black. Right now this is in line format. So if we try to screen print this, we wouldn't be able to because black, this would not be black enough right here to expose on the screen. It might be black enough right here, but we not get a full color or gradient effect. In order to do that we have to print half tone. And you can't create a half tone effectively without a rip. A rip stands for Rashed Image Processor. This is the same exact image printed with halftones and then scanned in to show you what halftones look like. This is screen printable. What we saw before would not be screen printable. Now how does the RIP know what size the halftone dot to print? Basically, it just reads the color value and the level of black in the image. So if we take a look at our info tab, right up here in the right hand corner, and we scroll over certain parts of this image, we notice that this is 80% black. Right here, this is 5% black. Right here, this is 0% black. So that means that right here it's going to print 80% of a half tone dot. Right here it's going to print 5%. Right here it's going to print nothing. That's how Accurip knows what size a half tone dot to print. The RIP itself, all it does is read the color values and convert it into screen printable half tones. Seems pretty easy, right? But why is it so important? There's other ways to create half tones. Some people create them in Photoshop, Corel Draw by bitmapping. Let's take a look at what those half tones look like. Here's the same image bitmapped in Photoshop looks pretty good from afar, but let's zoom in. This is a four color process image. This is 100%. This is what the halftones are going to look like on the page. They don't look consistent, they're jagged, they're very poor quality halftones. Try screen printing this, especially like in a complicated print like four color process, a simulated process, and get your work to come out the way you want it to look. Here we have both images. The first, a five step process to convert into bitmaps into Photoshop, pain in the butt, plus very inconsistent halftones. The second, simple clip of a button printed through Accurip. Now keep in mind, this is a scanned in image of a film positive printed through Accurip. Let's zoom in and see what we got. Zooming into 67.7%, we see we have once again, inconsistent halftones, plus it was a pain to get there. Zooming into Accurip, 67%, much more consistent high quality halftones that actually would convert into a very nice looking screen print. Once again, it's also done with a simple click of the button. Bin mapping or using a free rip program is not the right way to print halftones. You're going to spend a lot of time doing it, they're not going to look very good, and it's going to drive you crazy. Accurip solves that solution for you in a professional, easy way. Accurip not only creates halftones, but it also tells your printer to lay more ink down quicker. And it also is the only rip on the market that uses all black ink. This means that your printer can print faster, save you money, and make it darker positive. And when printing a film positive, it's super important to be opaque so light doesn't get through your film during the exposure process. Check out a free 14-day trial of Accurip at silkscreeningsupplies.com and see why everyone prefers Accurip as their screen printing halftone solution. So this is the print of our waterproof film positive. It's very dark. As you can see, if I hold this up to light, because we use that Epson printer, we actually created a nice dark waterproof film positive. So this is the waterproof film that you got with your kit, and there's two sides of it. There's the waterproof receptive side, which we printed the inkjet on, that received the ink. We used best quality photo settings as described that created a nice dark positive, and we can actually look at that through the light, and we're not seeing light through that. Um, even if you see a little bit of light through it, as long as it's pretty opaque and dark, should work out pretty good. So next we'll actually come over here and start exposing the screen. However, before we do that, what we're going to do is we're going to draw a center line down the center of our palette and also the center of our screen. So our palette is 16 inches, meaning that we're going to draw a line at the 8 inch mark. So we're using a T-square to do so. And you can also make sure that it's aligned center to your press as well. So this is center of the press and center of the palette right here. We're using a Sharpie to center everything up. And then as we discuss, we have our artwork lines here. So now we have the artwork and the press all centered up. Next, 
we'll go ahead and attach this to the frame. Let's go ahead and turn the lights off, even though we're in demo mode, because we need to do this in a light safe environment. We've stored our screens in a black trash bag to keep the light out of them. But remember, this is unexposed right now, so we need to make sure to turn the lights off. So we're in a light safe environment because we actually took our screen out. So now we're in a true light safe environment. That's why it's yellow with our light safe yellow bulb. So we've got our center lines in our film from the artwork section, and we got the center lines in our platen. Here's our t-shirt mark once again, and we're going three fingers down. So three fingers down from there. And then now what we're simply going to do is we're going to take the screen exposure light out and put the screen back in. Now this is the unexposed screen, so it needs to be done in a dark or light safe environment. Obviously not in the dark. Take that out for just a second. And then we'll go ahead and pop this guy in. Make sure it's centered out. And then we'll slowly bring this down. Now before we bring this down, we've actually taken some clear scotch tape and put it on the reverse side of this film. So we put it upside down, put the scotch tape on the reverse side of this film. So that as we bring the screen down, this tape actually sticks to it. It's, it's an ingenious way to actually pre-align your artwork. Instead of having to get the T-square out and everything, now our artwork's aligned, centered. And as we bring the screen down, it's obviously going to be in the same spot as we print with. So we're going to make sure our screen's centered, actually. So what we're going to do is we're going to center it out on your platen. I'm just feeling it. And then a good idea is actually to take just some a Sharpie, and you can actually just draw right on the feet. So you know approximately when that screen's going to be in that center position from, from then on. So if you're doing another image, you don't have to move it, because if you move it, then that, that film actually moves underneath, and, and that's no good. So once again, we just moved it and centered it. So we're going to center that one more time, three inches, three fingers down, excuse me. And then now as our screen's in the center position, here we can clamp it down so it doesn't move. We'll slowly bring it down, and we'll place it to the platen, and then we'll apply the tape. So that puts the image in the exact spot that we need it on the frame. Then we'll bring it up, apply the rest of the tape around. Now we simply take this back out and put this guy back in. And now we are ready to expose the screen. Tape is in the spot that we need it. And that's centered up and in place. And we want to take this and we want to make it so that the image is approximately directly under the 500 watt halogen light. So our light's already centered out. But we want to make sure that this is directly under the 500 watt halogen light so it's hitting it from straight on. We also want to make sure that it's as flat as possible. So you actually can take some more tape and tape it down. If you have some clear glass, not plexiglass, clear glass, you could take the glass and put it over your frame as well. So that will help hold it down. The tighter this is, the more detail you would actually get. If it's not very tight, you're not going to get a ton of detail. So if we tape it and we create a positive contact, which positive contact is, is how much pressure is pressed between the film positive and the screen mesh. Now because this is an overhead exposure, even with some glass on, we're not going to get a lot of positive contact. So we're limited a little bit by detail. We do have some higher end exposure units that allow us to actually take this and press this together and shoots the light from underneath using pressure or a vacuum. So if you want to get into screen printing a little bit more seriously, we'd recommend going to a below exposure system instead of this above exposure system. But you put some glass here, that will hold this down a little bit if you want to. Just be careful not to get sharp glass because that would obviously hurt your hands and your screen. So now we're going to go ahead and take this and expose it. Now exposing the screen is important. Once again, light safe environment and we want to get a timer on this. This is not on a timer. So let's actually check the exposure time, check with our manual and make sure we're exposing it for the right time and we'll set our timer accordingly. One great thing about doing business with Rionet is if you ever get stuck, feel free to contact us on Facebook, contact us through our support or knowledge base which has three, four hundred articles on it that tell you the exact exposure times for something or off contact or pressure settings or you can help troubleshoot you through some of these processes. The screen printing process has a lot of variables in it. 
So as you're going, you need help. One thing that we didn't have when we started was help. So we allow you to give us a call toll free. Uh, just call right on it up. We're available 12 hours a day, uh, 6 a.m. Pacific Standard Time to 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Or visit us online, chat with us on Facebook, connect with us on YouTube. And a lot of times you don't even have to call us. So I'm actually calling into our tech support department now to uh, see what they can recommend me for an exposure time. Hey, this is Ryan. Hey, I need to actually know uh, something. Okay. I, need to, I need to know how long to expose a hobby kit screen with a 500 watt halogen light. Do you have it on the stand? Yep. Um, it's going to be uh, uh, 13 minutes. Now, is that with or without the glass in there? I've never taken the glass off. Okay. So that would, that would be with the glass on. Um, I know TJ says with the glass off, it's about nine minutes. Okay, so you're going to recommend nine minutes? All right, that's what we'll go for, and uh, we'll adjust accordingly. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Bye. So, uh, great technical support. Just give us a call or visit us online, support.silktrainingsupplies.com, and or visit us and chat with us on Facebook because we're on there all the time too. Okay, so we're taking this over to our sink and we're going to be using cold water to rinse this out. Once again, light safe environment, remember? So we're going to get the water and we're going to develop the screen by getting it wet on both sides. So as soon as we get it wet, we should see our image in the screen. So we're going to get it wet on that side and we're going to get it wet on the screen side. Ink side. Once the screen is wet, now we're going to start developing it. So if for some reason you can't do this in a light safe area, what you want to do is you want to get a black trash bag, you want to keep the screen inside the trash bag, and then you want to get, so the trash bag keeps it you know, light safe. You want to take your screen and get it wet inside the actual trash bag, get it nice and soaked inside the trash bag, and let it develop for about one to two minutes. You don't want to let it sit with water on it for over two minutes. So after two minutes, it's nice and soft now, now we can rinse it out. Once it's developed, you can rinse it out in a, in a more bright area. You don't want to do it in the direct hot sunlight, but if you can't do it in a light safe area like this, you could do it outside. Optimally, if you can keep everything in a light safe area, we'd be good to go. So this is developing right now, and we're, we're keeping it wet. So you, know, you can wet it down one more time on each side. If your screen's properly exposed, you shouldn't feel a lot of slime on the inside of your screen right here. So this screen's actually very nicely exposed, and we're not feeling a lot of slime in there, and except for the areas of the screen that are unexposed, and those are going to be very slimy. So if your screen's not exposed long enough, this can be for you have too much emulsion on the screen. So for instance, here's a good example. See how the bottom parts of the screen right here is thick? This is slimy down here, much thicker emulsion down here because of the way the screen was coated with a scoop coater. So this is going to be slimy. If your screen is very thick, your exposure times are going to be different than our recommended exposure times because it's not all the way penetrated through that screen, that emulsion, right? So it's always good to keep a lot of pressure on that scoop coater when you're coating it. That's going to keep it as close as possible to our recommended exposure times. So now that our screen's developed for about two minutes, we're going to go ahead and rinse it out. To rinse it out, we're going to use a little bit of pressure, and then we're going to go ahead and just spray the screen like that. We're going to do that on the flat side or the shirt side of the screen. As you can see, see the image start to rinse out? And you shouldn't have to scrub at it that, I mean, you shouldn't have to spray it that hard for it to, to come out. Just a little bit of pressure there, and we're getting our image to, to wash out nicely. This is when water can get all over the place, so keep a towel nearby.
Now you, you can rinse your registration marks out. You don't have to. I am just to show you guys. But now that screen is all rinsed out. We can actually turn the lights back on and see what we got. So let's go ahead and turn the lights on. Ta-da, we have ourselves a screen. So last step is to take some very good quality paper towels and just dab the inside of the screen, just very slightly. You don't want to scrub at it at all. So also, if this screen's properly exposed, you should not see pink stuff on there like that. You notice I've, I take the paper towel on the top, no pink stuff. Where it's thicker down here, pink stuff coming off. So that's the emulsion actually being underexposed. If your screen's properly coated like you have here, it should be properly exposed. Now, this is actually not the screen that we started out with. This is a second screen. Um, to, to expedite the uh, filming process, we actually did two screens here. So that's the second screen. And we actually did this to show you guys how a lot of your screens will look if they're coated too thick of emulsion. So as you see, thicker down here, smoother down here. Now the image area, the screen is going to look fine. But this screen right here, this is the screen that we coated and started out with. Now as you can see, this is a much better coat, uh, much more consistent. But it's important that you don't let water sit on the screen. If you let water sit on it, and especially if it's underexposed, if you feel that slime back there, that slime's going to drip into your image area. It's going to block your image area. So you want to hold your screen up to light. You want to make sure that your image is not blocked out at all. What you can do to expedite the drying process is you can do one of two things. A, we can actually take this back to our exposure light, put it back under the light, and rebake the screen. This actually works great for drawing your screens because you got a nice hot bright light and you're hardening your screen. Meaning that the thing about making a stencil or an emulsion stencil is you want it to be hard. The harder it is, the more it's going to resist your ink. The more it resists your ink, the easier it actually reclaims. So you might think, okay, well a hard screen is not going to come out of the screen that easily. But it's actually the opposite. Because the hard screen resists the chemicals, it actually reclaims much easier. So for instance, if we're looking at these two screens right here, this screen with all this emulsion in the bottom of it is going to be a lot harder to reclaim than this screen right here. The screen's going to reclaim much easier because it's got that nice consistent coat. And that's going to come with time as you're practicing those coating processes. Once again, those tips for coating, don't be afraid to put a lot of pressure on and make sure you have a good emulsion well built up and then coat that screen on the flat side of the screen and then the shirt, or excuse me, the ink side of the screen second. Let that screen dry upside down in a nice clean area, making sure that it's nice and dry before you actually go to print with it or to expose it. So once the screen's dry, next step is going to taping and then aligning on the press. All right, guys, so now that we have the screen post-exposed, we've hardened it and let it dry underneath the light, now it's time to tape it up. So we can go ahead and take the light off. Make sure to let it cool down. This light's cooled down for a couple minutes. We can go ahead and take this off and then store this for future use. We don't need it right away for a bit. So I'm just going to put it in our cupboard here. And to tape the screen off, I'm simply going to set it down on the platen. And I'm, we're going to be using the screen tape. Now this is a solvent resistant special tape that resists both the ink and does not goop up your screen. So you got a, a decent amount of this with your kit and it will go a long way. But as you run out of it, because it is a consumable supply, we would not recommend getting like a, a masking tape or a duct tape or even the clear packing tape because that's going to leave a goo or residue in your screen and when you're cleaning it out, the, the inks, the tape's actually going to degrade. So this is a special screen tape. It's available on our website. Very affordable too, by the way. You don't have to spend, you know, five, six dollars a roll for your standard tape. It's not going to work that well. So here we go. Basically what we're doing is taking a strip of tape off. Now, I've actually kind of gotten in the bad habit of just ripping this tape with my teeth like this. Once again, bad habit. So don't recommend doing that unless uh, you don't care about your dental health. So here is the right way to do it just by, so I tape it, I, I put it on the edge of the frame right here. So that way I can just pull the tape out and then I can take either what we're using right here is just a sharp knife or scissors works fine too and then cut it. Now there's a trick to actually applying this tape and it's not going to be easy to do it first. It takes a little bit of skill. So why don't you come on in here and we can actually see how I'm doing it. 
So the reason we tape the screen is because ink will actually get through the edge of your screen right here. We don't want that to happen. So we're going to take this special screen tape and the way we apply it is we cut it to size like we just showed you, but we apply it to the screen and the emulsion itself first. So see how I apply it down here and I even it all out. Then I take my hand and I push it towards the edge to make a nice seam. See how that's making a nice seam right there? I should be able to take my finger all the way right along the, uh, the screen seam right here without breaking the tape. Now this is a good tape job right here. What can happen if you don't get it down smooth enough or consistent enough is it will create air pockets and as you're cleaning or printing the screen it will actually break the tape. That pressure of your hand or the squeegee will break the tape and that will make a mess because the reason you're taping the screen is to keep ink out of the screen. So. Once again, that's my habit of ripping it with your teeth. Not the best, but what we're doing again is we're taping it down here. You want to be careful to not let it stick to the frame. And then with a finger, simply apply it there. See how that got a little air bubble there? But since I didn't have it taped top yet, the last thing you do is come tape it to the frame itself. Now, I personally like doing it like this backwards just because it goes fast and you want to tape the screen in a consistent order. So start here, go here, here. You want to go top and bottom, side and side because you want to be able to pull the tape off one side and take the whole rest of the tape off. So I just do it like this, apply it and it can go really fast and easy. So that screen's all the way taped off with the exception of our registration marks which are right there and there. So what we're going to do with this is we're actually just going to tape this with plastic, or excuse me, clear, duct, clear tape. And the reason why we're taping that with clear tape is because it's a small mark and that way we can still see through the screen when we're lining it up on the palette underneath. So this screen's taped up nice and good. Now, you can apply more tape, which does help in the cleaning process. So let's say I take just a little bit more tape off and then I'll put it over the bottom of the screen like this where a lot of ink often gets. So that, that way I'm protecting the frame right there. Which is not necessarily to do, necessary to do, but it does make cleaning a lot better. So now let's go to set the press up. When we burn the screen, we kept it in the press, so we actually drew on here where it fits into the screen. So I'm going to put it back into the frame approximately where it goes. Now before I place it in there all the way, I'm not going to tighten it down because what we're going to do is we're going to look through the screen and look at the center registration marks and we're going to line it up to the center mark in the platen. So see how that lines up right there? Oh, it got off a little bit there. So it lines up right there and it lines up right there. And once it lines up, I'm going to hold it down so it doesn't move and then I'm going to tighten my screen clamps. And that's really how easy it is to align your frame. Next what we're going to do is we're going to adjust the off contact of the screen press. So what off contact means is the amount of distance between the palette, this is your palette right here, and this is your screen. On contact means this is pressed down closely together and there's no space between. Off contact means there's a small amount of space there. Now when I'm, I'm going to take my squeegee here guys and I'll kind of demonstrate what the printing process will do. When I'm printing with my squeegee, and if there's no space for that ink to release, what's going to happen is the ink's going to actually stay in the screen mesh. Now if that happens, when we pull the screen back up, the ink's going to pull back up with it. So what off contact does is it gives us a little bit of space to allow that screen to release and then pop up and let the ink stay down on the shirt and out of the screen mesh. So off contact is important, especially when printing with thicker inks. So we have two inks that come with the kit, a white ink and a black ink. Completely different consistencies. A white ink is thicker. So see, I can dump that upside down, no ink comes out of it. The reason why white's actually thicker is because it has more color pigment in it than black ink does. Even though black's darker, it's much thinner because black ink, see that, it's kind of like watery. Black ink covers white or light garments. White ink covers black or dark garments. 
in order for that white to show up on a black or dark garment, it has to have more color pigment in it, and that's why it's thicker. So the difference between printing this ink and this ink is going to be way different for you as you're printing. We're actually going to start out and show printing the white ink on a black garment. Now when you're printing with one screen and you're doing color changes, you always want to print light ink first and then dark ink second. So if in this case, we would print the white and then the black. If we were printing red and black, we would print red first and then black. If we were printing red and blue, we'd print red first and then blue. So light ink first, uh, darker ink second. Now, you can completely rinse out this screen and you know, let's say you do print a black ink, you can eventually put a white ink through it again. It's just harder to clean out. And when you're going light to dark, you don't have to spend as much time cleaning, which you know, expedites the printing and cleaning process. So what we're going to do now is show you how to set off contact on the press for this specific job. The first way we showed you to set off contact is using an off contact plate. Now, this is about an eighth of an inch, and it sets down on the platen. We take the screen, we set it down, then we use our half inch wrench, and we loosen up the off contact and the tilt controls on the back of the screen clamp. Now, once again, the off contact controls are located directly in the back. The tilt controls, this is the top of the back two tilts. And by loosening both, what this allows us to do is actually adjust and move this screen. So this screen can move freely now. So we're going to make sure the arms all the way press down into the gate and then allow this screen to move freely and set it down over this off contact plate. Once this screen's set down, now we tighten everything else back up. And that's what the wrenching, ratcheting half inch wrench comes into play for. You do want to tighten it decently tight. You don't ever want to overstrip things. And then for this back one, we're going to grab our crescent wrench back here or another half inch wrench to adjust a little easier. Okay. Now everything's adjusted. So we'll take our off contact plate off and then take a look at the off contact on the press. This screen actually has perfect off contact. It's got about an eighth of an inch. Now this is a little high. We could go lower. The thing is, is the thickness of the ink does matter. The black ink, because it is thinner, doesn't need as much off contact. So it could be lower or even with black ink it could be directly on contact. But for white ink this is probably a good amount. If you notice that there's ink sticking in your mesh, raising this off contact up is how to compensate for that. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the printing process. So this is perfect um, and you can adjust it, use different thicknesses of boards. You don't really need to go much higher than this though. Now once the off contact is set, it stays fairly consistent. There are a couple variables. One is depending on where you put the screen and the screen clamp, that may change the tilt of the screen. Also if you're using wood screens like we have here, they tend to warp over time if you get a lot of images on them or get a lot of water on it. So that will change how the, the off contact is centered on the platen. We do have aluminum screens available, so and, and they're a little bit larger format which allows you to do larger images on this, plus they don't warp over time. So if you're investing in more frames, investing in aluminum frames is not a bad idea. Because we actually align the screen before we adjust to the off contact, the off contact actually changed the position of the screen slightly. So we're going to realign the screen, simply do these easy to follow center crop marks. Once again, you got to use those center crop marks, it makes life so easy. And then clamp the screen in. Now there is one more thing that we want to notice. If you notice, as I'm pulling this screen across and pushing it down, it flexes at the end here. So we can use a simple, what's called an off contact tab. I'm going to take a little tape and a washer, which is about the same thickness of our off contact, and tape it to the edge of the screen here, the rigid frame where it actually meets the platen. So I have a little washer here. And now it actually holds it up instead of letting it flex down. So it's perfect to control your off contact. So my screen's aligned, it's taped up, I have my off contact set, and the next step is to put pallet adhesive down and then do a test print. Before we put pallet adhesive down, there are a few things that we want to consider. First, we want to make sure that our pallet is nice and clean. So we're going to take a dry, slightly damp rag and clean that pallet off to make sure there's no dust and dirt on it. Second, if we do want to use what's called pallet tape, we wanted to show you how to use that. Pallet tape actually is a protectant tape 
It does not come in the kit, by the way. So this is an aftermarket product. We're not going to use it, but we do want to show you how it's used and why it's used because a lot of screen printers really like this stuff. So this tape actually protects the pallet and makes it very, very easy to clean. So it's very cost effective. You can also use it for other things in your shop. But simply we're taking a sharp exacto, cutting the tape off after we put it on the platen, using the tape itself to squeegee the tape on so there's no, there's no wrinkles in the tape itself, and then taking our exacto and cutting around the platen, making the tape and giving the tape a nice smooth and consistent edge here. So what this tape does is it protects the platen and it makes it very easy to print with and very easy to draw on and very easy to clean. So it protects the platen, makes your platens last longer and makes them a lot easier to clean. So what we'll do is we'll just show you how easy it is to peel this tape off. Because the tape doesn't come in the kit, we're actually not going to print with the tape on there. But you get the point. It's very, very simple to use. And it's a great investment because platens cost a lot more than tape. And if you ruin your platen or if it gets too much goop on it, you can't clean it, then the tape is an easy solution. So here we have the tape. We can actually take our Sharpie. We can draw on it. Let's say that's the neckline. Or let's say we're doing a pocket print. We can draw a little pocket square over here. So you can do all sorts of stuff with this tape, make a mess out of it. And then when you're done, just simply peel it back and we have a clean platen once again. Now it is nice to draw a permanent center line in your platen, even if you are using the tape, because that's always a good reference point, and that allows you not have to get the T-square out every single time and recenter it on out. So this is, you can toss that tape now. Now since we're not using pallet tape, we're going to go straight to pallet adhesive. Now this is a, it's called ProBond Pallet Adhesive. We're going to cut the cap off. This goes a very long way. So you don't get a lot of it with a kit, but you don't need a lot of it. This will last a long time if you use it the right way. So we'll cut the, the top off. Now essentially this is a water-based pallet adhesive. If you've ever seen any of the videos on screen printing, you might notice that they use spray adhesive. Spray adhesive might be a little easier to use, but it definitely doesn't go as far and it's not as good for the environment. So this adhesive right here, we use one time and it lasts a very long time. It works very well and it's easy to clean. So we put a little bit down, and what we're doing is we're using one of our Ultimate Ink cards here that came with the kit and just spreading it around. Now, the cool thing about these ink cards is, once again, you can wash this off and use it again. So the amount of adhesive, that amount of glue I put there, this is even a little bit too much. So you saw how much I put down, and we can actually, we could not even put that much down, but we want to consistently spread it throughout the platen, and then we're going to let it just tack up or just air dry for a second. Now because we used a little bit too much, we're just going to scrape the rest of it off. This is water-based, so it cleans up very easily with warm water in case you get it on your platen or you get it on your floor. It cleans up very easily with warm water. Now that our adhesive is on, you do want to make sure that you cap it and then store it. You don't want to store it in a very hot spot because it is glue and it will dry out. Before we start test printing, we want to get our curing device out. Today we're going to be showing you using both an iron and a heat gun. So we're going to plug our iron in and we're going to plug our heat gun in and get these ready. Now the heat gun doesn't need to warm up. This does not come in the kit, but it is an option as an upgrade to the package and uh, does work really, really well. The iron, most people have an iron, so that's also not included in the kit. But if you're using an iron, you want to put it on the max settings, absolutely no steam as hot as it will get. So we're going to let that warm up while we're getting things ready. Also, we want to get our curing strips out and some t-shirts. So we're going to be printing white ink on a black shirt. Now why are we printing the white ink first? Well, the reason why we're doing it first is because remember, print lighter ink first if you're going to be doing color changes or changing the ink on the screen. So we're going to print white ink on a black shirt first. Now let's show you how to load that shirt and practice loading while the iron is getting hot. So the goal of loading a shirt is to get it on the pallet straight. We've already idealized where our neckline is, and we did that once again by taking our neckline and three inches down from that, we placed the top of our image. So roughly three inches or three fingers down. So the neckline, 
You don't typically want to put at the top of the sh top of the platen. Here, here's our platen. We don't want to put the neckline at the top. You want to place it a little bit down. So we place it about two inches down to allow that neck to kind of hang over. We do have other platens available for the starter kit that we have here for this press. Those platens actually have necklines in them. Here's an example of one of those platens. Now the other cool part about this platen is not only does it have a neckline, it also has a bracket underneath it. So instead of having to screw the platen on, you can just simply slide it on and off. These are standard t-shirt platens, but there are also sleeve platens, youth platens, infant platens, all sorts of other different platens. You can even buy a platen package with the brackets on it for a very affordable price with this kit. So if you start using the kit, you want to do more stuff. We have you know, platens for posters, for large shirts, for larger screens, for sleeves, all sorts of stuff. So check those out on our website under the starter kit page. So one thing that we can use if we do get the heat gun is we can actually warm up this platen by just putting the heat gun on high and throwing it over the platen to warm up that adhesive. The adhesive actually works better when it's warm. So that's an easy way to tack up your adhesive, get it nice and sticky and hot. So you don't have to do that once again. But what we're going to do now is we're going to go ahead and put the shirt on. So if you noticed, shirts have a very, very faint center line in them. And because we have a center line in the press, what we're going to do is we're going to open the shirt up as far as we can possible and kind of bunch it up like that. See how I made a nice big opening on the shirt? Then we're going to take it. Here we go. We're opening it up. We're placing it over. We can see our center line very faint in the shirt. We're lifting the shirt up all at once and placing it down. Now we went a little bit too far, so we're lifting the shirt all at once over there, and then just placing it down nice and easy, pulling it directly to our center line right there. Once it's down, we're going to flatten it out, and now we put the screen down in the print position, and everything should line up accordingly. So now, after all that, it's time to print a shirt. Are you ready? This is the fun part, to actually see the creation come to life on the garment or on the poster, or whatever you're printing. So we're going to take our white water-based ink, this is an opaque ink, we're going to use one of our ink cards and scoop some of this ink up. Now, water-based will dry out on the screen. You'll notice that the white ink will dry out faster than the black ink, so you want to use a little bit more white ink on the screen at a time than the black ink. And if you're clean and you're consistent and you're safe with your ink, it will last a lot longer. So we're going to scoop as much ink off back from the container. We're going to cap it, and then we're going to grab our squeegee and do what's called a pre-flood. So a pre-flood handles the ink and floods the screen. Now, when you're not printing, you always want to leave your screen flooded like that. You don't want to see the image. The reason that is is that keeps the ink wet in the mesh. If the ink's dry in the mesh, what happens is that ink starts to dry up. If the ink starts to dry up, you have to get some water or rag out, clear the screen, which we'll show you how to do. But it's a lot, makes it a lot more difficult. So I'm going to move this to the side over here. And we actually have some weight on the back of here because this is not anchored down. It's much, much better to anchor your press down. Our iron's nice and hot. And we also have our curing sheets right here. These are what we're going to use to actually put over the ink and iron between coats. Now, white ink, because it's going on a black garment, needs to be printed typically twice. We'll show you how it looks after one print. Now here's our pressure and angle of the squeegee. So if you notice, my squeegee's not all the way down and it's not all the way up. Your squeegee wants to be at about an 80 degree angle like that and you don't need to put a lot of pressure down. You want to have a good angle, not necessarily a lot of pressure. A lot of new printers will want to come up here and they'll, this is what they'll do. They'll take your squeegee and they'll press down so hard on the squeegee that it actually just smashes ink through the screen. That's not what you want to accomplish. You want to have about an 80 degree angle right here and you want to shear the ink from the mesh, which is already sitting in right now, onto the shirt. So we got that good angle. What we're going to do is we're going to get over the print and we're going to pull across it. There are two ways to print. You can pull or you can push. Now pushing actually is a little easier because you're pushing against the print. Now when you're pushing, you're putting your body weight into it. So Wherever you're setting your press up, you want your press to be about waist high. If it's any higher, it gets harder to use. If it's any lower, your back starts to hurt. So this is a perfect height for me personally. If the, the kitchen counter height and you're using your kitchen is, a little, kitchen is a little tall for you, just get a simple, simple step stool and just stand on it or make one out of wood or something like that. We're actually going to show you guys pushing. Pushing actually is really easy to do. So we're just going to take the ink and we're going to push it through the screen. And we can actually see the ink transfer now. 
We're going to lift the screen up, we're going to flood it up again, and we're going to push again to practice. Push the ink twice through the screen. So see how I'm clearing the screen and pushing with it? So that's two prints. Oh wow, sweet. We got the ink on the shirt. That's awesome. Now remember, keep the ink flooded in the screen. So see how it was left open for a second there? We don't want to do that. You want to take the ink, you want to flood it. So you want to keep as much ink going through the mesh as possible. So this is one print without a what's called a flash. And if you can zoom in and you can see this, it, you can definitely see the black shirt through there. So it looks kind of cool and looks distressed and will feel soft, but it doesn't look nice and bright. In order to get nice and bright, what we're going to do, we're going to take our curing sheet, put it over the actual image, and we'll take our iron, which is nice and hot, as hot as it'll go, and iron that. Now, what the curing sheet does is it actually protects the ink. So what the iron is doing is it's setting, it's its heat setting, the ink underneath. You don't need to do what's called a final cure. You just need to do a simple heat set. Now make sure your iron's nice and hot. This isn't my favorite iron in the world. It doesn't get hot very fast. And then you can feel it and you can see how hot it's getting. So do it for about 30 seconds or so depending on how hot your iron is. And what you can actually do, you can see it and let it steam off for a second there, but you can feel it. And if you're feeling it with your, sh with your finger and no ink's coming off, that's a good sign. It should feel a little sticky with no ink coming off. So we did our first coat, now it's time for our second one. So once again, we have ink flooded in the screen right here. And we're going to be pushing it at about an 80 degree angle, and then we're going to push it twice. So there's our first push, and then we're going to pull it up. Now, this is when the, the longer you let this ink sit in the screen, the more risk that you have of letting it dry up in the mesh. I'll show you what I'm talking about here in a second. But let's do our second pull first. There's our second pull. We got everything cleared out of the screen. We can actually see the screen mesh clear out by doing that. Boom, nice and bright. We see a nice bright print with our water-based opaque white ink. Now, final cure time. So we're going to set this over the print. And you want to use the same side that you did before, so we use that side. Now what we need to do to finally cure the ink is the ink needs to reach about 320 degrees to set in the shirt. A couple different ways to do that. First, the iron. Second, the heat gun. Third, we can even use an oven. So with the iron, what we'll do is we'll set it on top of this, and you're going to want to iron the ink, this ink, for roughly now, make, you do need to use this curing sheet. Very, very important to use that curing sheet when you're ironing the ink. But make sure the iron's hot, and then you want to iron the ink here for about two minutes. So when we're ironing the ink, we're ironing it section at a time. We're making sure that our iron's nice and hot. You don't need to put a lot of pressure down, but you also want to make sure that you're ironing each section at a time. So the ink's getting really hot in this section, but we need to make sure the ink gets hot in this section and the overlap section right here. So Ironing is kind of cool because you already have, probably have an iron at home and you do each section at a time for about two minutes. Once it's that two minute time is done for each section, just pull it up and your ink should steam like that. If it doesn't steam like that, that probably means it's not cured. Also, you want to feel the ink. Let it evaporate out for a second and maybe just hit that one more time. You know, if your ink doesn't cure, what happens is the shirt actually will wash out. So it's very important that this ink is cured all the way. So by hitting it another time with the iron, after you allowing that steam to come out of it, it's getting the, all that water vapor out of the ink. This is a water-based ink, so we do need to make sure that water vapor is out of the ink. And by the way, because white ink is thicker than like the colored inks, the black inks, the red inks, you're going to need to iron the white ink for longer. So there's a nice bright white ink, two passes, on a black shirt. First print coming off this press, I'm pretty happy with it. So now we're going to break the shirt off the press. It's pretty hot and it's sticky, so what we do is we don't break it off all at once. We peel it back one section at a time and we allow that shirt to kind of release from the press before we pull it off. So let's pull it off and show you guys what we got. There we have it. It's definitely more than a hobby. Nice and bright using Ronit's starter kit. So very cool. So we can actually test this ink now and make sure it's cured all the way by slightly stretching it. So we can slightly stretch the ink like that. 
See how we're slightly stretching the ink like that? It shouldn't crack. If it cracks really bad, so it's, it's staying fairly consistent here, and it shouldn't be sticky. So if it's sticky or if it cracks, see how it's stretching? That's a good sign. It means it should be cured all the way. But if you feel it, if it's, not, if, it's not, if it's a little sticky or if it starts to crack, that means it's under cured. Now, at that point, you could come back over here, put this down, take the iron back, put that sheet on, and iron it again. So you could do that, but you do not need to make sure that that's the most important part. It's cured all the way. But we got an awesome shirt here. Now let's show you printing it and curing it with the temp gun. Next shirt, we're going to place it in the same spot. So open it up all the way once again. Let it slide all the way on the platen. Pick it up by the sleeve corners and then move it back until it's in the center spot there. Now don't get super technical about this, guys. If it's off a sixteenth of an inch, it's a t-shirt. You know, it's not an in-register artistic print. So you know some printers that like are so anal about it, they'll take two minutes to line the shirt up. You don't need to do that. But our platen's cooled down a little bit. You want to make sure that if you're doing a lot of ironing on your platen, you do let it cool down in between prints. If it gets too hot, then when you print it, it's actually going to cure the ink, which is a bad thing. So now this ink's been sitting in the screen for a little bit of time, and it could start drying out. We're going to actually show you doing a pull stroke, and we'll also show you printing a, or cleaning the screen out. So now we're going to place our squeegee at a 60 or 70, 85, excuse me, ready to do that again. Now we'll place our squeegee at about a 70 degree, 75 degree right here, and then we're going to pull the ink across. Typically, you don't want to push and then pull with the same print. So um, this is not recommended, but since we do want to show both in this video, we're going to do it just to, to show it. So we're going to pull it off like that and see what's happening here. See this right here? This is ink not releasing from the, the mesh. So this is one of two things. So we're, the first thing is, is the screen's dried, which is bad. Water-based ink will dry on the screen. If you switch to Plastisol ink in a future date, it won't dry on the screen, which is good. So Plastisol is a little bit more user-friendly, but it is harder to print because it is thicker. So what we're going to do is we're going to flood the screen again. This time we're going to push it a little bit harder. Then we're going to place the screen back down and we're going to print again, but this time we're going to put a little bit more pressure on it to see if we can clear that screen out. So see how that screen cleared out just a little bit more? We'll do that one more time. You see how you kind of had some chunky spots right here? That means my squeegee was, I was putting too much pressure and my squeegee was actually bowing under that pressure. So I'm going to raise my squeegee angle a little bit more. And see how that off contact lifts up and lets the ink sit down on the shirt. So that's actually good. Our screen didn't clog at all. So we'll flood the screen up again. And then that's one print. Now that's a print without even a flash. Nice bright white. That's, that's a pretty good print, but we did hit it three times. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do, using the heat gun, we're going to do a flash. So this heat gun's a little bit nicer than the iron because it forces out hot air. And we don't have to let that ink gas at all because it's not underneath a closed surface like that curing paper. So we got, we want to cure it so it's sticky. So that's all sticky, but it's not coming off on our hands. With a nice heat gun like we have here, we should be curing this at about you know, 10 seconds or so for a flash. Now, this is not a final cure. So then we'll place the screen down again. And then one more time, aggressive print stroke, making sure all that ink clears out of the screen. Now, up here, what's happening is our ink's not clearing out. So we're going to hit that one more time. And as you see, down here, nice and bright, but up here, you see a little ink stuck in the mesh. So what we're going to show you how to do is how to clean that out. That means it's dried. So if your screen dries up, take a little bit of warm water, a little tiny bit of warm water on a rag, and just take that water and open up the mesh like so. So we're just going to open up that mesh. Now, once the mesh is opened up, it, it's water-based ink, so it, you'll be surprised. It opens up pretty fast, pretty, which is really cool. Once that's opened up on the outside of the screen, you want to take a dry part of that rag and make sure to dry that up real nice. Because if it's wet, it will transfer to your design. So we let that dry up real nice. Now we're going to flood that ink up again to load the stencil. 
So see how it didn't load right there the first time? That's because we had water residue there. So before we print again, to get that nice and bright up there, we're going to come over it with our heat gun. Make sure it's nice and tacky. Now we're doing this with the shirt stuck down to the platen, right? If we release the shirt, what happens? All right, so that's nice and good right there. Now we'll do one final print. And that time, the screen opened up nice and good on top. We got a nice bright white. So now we release the shirt, careful. To do our final cure, I'm going to take the shirt off the platen. So that's not, that's, that shirt's still wet. Now, the reason why we're taking it off the platen to do the final cure is with the heat gun, we want to make sure the heat has a chance to penetrate through the garment. If we leave it stuck on the platen, we're going to get our platen hot and the inks, the heat's not penetrating through the garment all the way. So, this final cure takes a little bit longer. We're going to hold it about three inches above and circle over each section of the ink for about 30 seconds or so. You'll actually see that ink start to steam out. That's a good sign because that's the curing. So you can touch it afterwards, make sure it's not feeling too sticky. Then we can even stretch it, do a stretch test. So with the heat gun, it does go a little faster than the iron, but once again, we're only curing one part of the ink at a time. And then if we don't cure it all the way, what happens is it will wash out. So it is a little consist inconsistent. Now if you get into production, this was, this was designed really for testing and doing some artistic prints, not high production. If you're going to be getting into high production, you want something that can cure the ink all at once. And for that, we actually use a flash dryer, which we'll show you in a, in a couple of minutes here on this video. Um, we didn't come with a kit, obviously, and you probably don't have a flash dryer at home, but if you are going to be getting into this more seriously, it's, something, it's the next step up for curing. You want to make sure that you're not getting too close to the garment because this gun's hot and it will burn it. So that's nice and good now. We can test it with a stretch test here. So it's, it's testing nicely. And we got a cured ink. So that's showing it using the heat gun. Nice bright white ink. So what happened here? When we actually were curing the ink, we didn't cover the screen with ink, so we didn't pre-flood the screen. Now the ink's dried up in the mesh. So a couple different options. If you need to keep your ink in the screen and you're gonna be doing a lot of printing with it, what we do recommend is getting a nice high quality squirt bottle and just using that squirt bottle to mist the ink, to keep it wet every once in a while. Once it's mist, mist it in the bottom and then remix it up. So take your squeegee and mix it up with the squeegee. Right now, this ink is actually dried out. So we're going to take the wet ink, scoop it back into the container, and then show you how to clean this screen out for a color change, because now we'll print black ink on a tan garment. So we'll open the ink container back up. We'll take our ultimate ink card, and we'll just scoop the wet ink back into the container. So we're scooping it off the squeegee. The more ink you scoop off, the more you save, the less ink you use, the more money you save. Now, if the ink's very, very dry, then you don't want to scoop it back up. So if, let's say it's dried up on your screen, like in a section and you can't get it off, don't worry about it. Just clean it off with some water. You don't want to put super dry ink in your screen. So right up here, it was pretty wet. So we're actually not going to do that. We're going to take a towel, a wet paper towel, clean our card off like that, and just scoop the wet ink back in. Now, you can take a knife and mix this ink up. So if it does start to dry out, what you can do is you can take this knife, just mix this ink all back together, and then close it off, and it will become nice and consistent again. We have a couple different products. One's called Print Gen. 
Print Gen is a reducer product that you can take in and mix into this ink. We also have a clear ink that you can mix into the sink. This makes the white ink less opaque, but easier to work with. So something to keep in mind whenever you're using these cards or these knives in water-based ink is take, some, take a warm rag, put some water on it, dry it right away. Because the longer you let this ink sit, the harder it gets to clean. So we're going to take some water, and you can see with water, this just cleans right up. It's water-based. So to clean that screen out for the color change, we put a lot of paper towels down here, or you can use a, some you know, thick plastic and then something that will absorb the water as we're using the water. Next, we got as much ink out as possible, and we're going to just take a little bit of water. I, if you notice, I put a glove on here, and then just put a little water in the screen, and then we just start to work that water into that, res that ink. And that water will evaporate, I mean, not evaporate, but clean out the ink from the screen. So we're just working the water into it with a rag, going around in circles here. You can even take one of your cleanup cards, use that, and that actually will make the process a little faster because it's, it's rough and coarse. You want to make sure to stay out of the image area if possible. And we don't want to let this water sit on the screen for that long. So we're going to down there. There, and we're taking that leftover water with the dry rag and then wiping it off. So once again, this is where a consistent tape job definitely pays dividends. We're just using regular shop towels. You can use regular paper towels, but the shop towels we find work a little bit better because they're more absorbent. So once a towel gets too saturated with ink, you can throw it away. Just get another towel out, so get it wet with water. And you can see the screen clean up pretty fast and easy just with the use of water. So there are some chemicals that you can actually use that make it go faster. There's two chemicals. One is a water-based screen opener, which is an aerosol chemical. Smells nice, foams up real nice in the screen. Cleans the screen a lot faster than just using water. The second is, is called EnviroSol. And we'll show you using EnviroSol specifically after we get done printing because it's more of a total cleanup. So because we're doing an ink switch, we do want to make sure we're getting ink, all the ink off. And as you can see, you can take a couple minutes here, but just with some nice warm water and a couple paper towels. You can also use rags, of course. We clean the screen up pretty fast and easy. There we are. So one more dry towel and do a, what's called a final buff. Make sure you got all the ink out of your image area too. So you got all the ink out of both sides of your image and you can actually see through the mesh and there's no ink stuff in, in it. If there is some ink stuck in the mesh there because that paper towel underneath, take one of these paper towels, get a wet, Take one of these paper towels and just get a little wet here, and then just scrub open that mesh. This is when that proper screen exposure comes into play too, because if your screen's not properly exposed, if it's soft, you can see how a soft or loose screen, a screen that's not very strong, how fast it might break down in a situation like this when you're scrubbing it. But this screen's color changed and ready to go. You can tell it's color changed because there's no white ink coming off of my towel anymore. So for you know, conscious purposes, we're going to save these towels so we can use them again. And we're also going to show you, see how this is a little linty right here? What we can do, we're going to clean up our countertop. Once again, just cleaning that up with water. If you get ink on you, I got a little ink on here. You can actually clean this up with water right now as it's on you. Just clean it up with water. Or if it goes through a wash cycle, it will clean up if you did spill a lot of ink. But obviously, clean the ink up right away. Keep a nice, clean work area. So what we can do with this palette adhesive is now it's not very sticky. 
So what we can actually do is we can take some warm water. We take a lint-free rag and just go over the palate to in the same type of thing. And what that's doing is that's getting all that lint off, but it's also reactivating that water-based palate adhesive. So it's so cool because this palate still has sticky on it. But we're taking off So we can see how much sticky it has on it. So took off all the lint. Takes our heat gun, go over with it, and it's still sticky. Pretty cool. Now, I think I scrubbed a little hard, so I'm gonna put a little sticky on it, but that's how you can clean that palette off and how easy it is with that water-based palette adhesive. Doing the same thing with our squeegee here. Warm water, just going over the squeegee cleaning it all off because we're doing a color change. Now, if you're going to be doing a lot of screen printing, get a couple more squeegees. That way you don't have to clean them as good. One for white ink, one for black ink, one for red ink. You notice I'm spilling a little bit of this on my floor, so I'm going to want to clean that up right away. But that's all nice and good. We're going to take a dryer rag now, clean that off. Make sure we get all the ink off the squeegee, especially in the print areas. So i got a nice clean squeegee here. This is great. Now Plastisol is different. If you're going to be using Plastisol, we definitely recommend getting a DVD and watching some of our YouTube videos on how to clean Plastisol in because it's not as easy. It, the, the plus side of Plastisol is it doesn't dry out in the screen. The downside is it's a little bit harder to clean up. So I'm just taking a rag, clean the floor up real fast. And now we'll go to put some black ink on a dark, or excuse me, black ink on a tan or a white shirt. These ultimate cleanup cards you can actually save up as well. It's rinsing off, wiping off the leftover ink residue, letting it sit. So hands, if you got ink on your hands, just wipe it off. You can actually use some of your screen degreaser on your hands or on some of the products to take the ink off. It just depends on how you know much consumable product you want to use. These ultimate ink cards, very awesome to use, very cheap. A lot of people don't need to clean them because you can buy a box of these things for like 40 bucks or a smaller box of 300 for you know half the cost. So you can those are just a, literally a couple pennies each but you can't clean them you only get a couple in your kit you really only need a couple but you can also you know reuse them and get others in future reference. So we're going to grab some more of our palette adhesive. Just pop this on again. We have our palette adhesive ink card. So remember with the palette adhesive we don't need a lot of it so I'm just going to do two strands of it right here. And I'll come over with my ultimate ink card, spread on that palette adhesive, make sure it's nice and easy, nice and smooth all over the palette. Don't have certain areas with no palette adhesive and certain areas with a ton of it on there. Done. Put that back away. Cap it, put that back away. Now it's time for black ink. Our screen's all cleaned out. In fact, we can touch it, make sure there's no ink on it. It's nice and cleaned, ready to do another color shirt. So one thing that we wanted to show you is actually these handy things. These are called test pellets. Very cheap. For doing test prints, aligning your shirt, you don't have to print on a shirt. These things cost a couple cents. You can just put it down, throw your screen down, take your black ink out, which is right here, now, what we're going to use with this black ink, instead of using another card, we're just going to use our ink knife. Getting these ink knives, man, they're so cool because basically you just dip it like that. You can get the rest of the ink off very quick and easy. They're flexible. Take one of your cleaning towels. Boom. Just wipe it off. It's done. Done. Ready to go. All clean. So, love those things. Great investment. Available on the website once again. All these supplies are available online. So now, if you notice this black ink so much thinner, so much easier to work with, and we're going to be pushing this. So we're just pushing it. We're going to do it twice. When you're flooding this ink, you don't have to press as hard. You basically just let the ink, like squeegee, just flood over the, the ink. So black ink is going to be a lot easier for you guys to print. But remember, we leave that ink 
up in the mesh area like that. So there is the black ink on a test pellet. So this is great to save for future reference to show a customer a job, to print a job. These are available on the website. They're very cheap and inexpensive, but they're great for testing purposes. So now let's actually go and put a shirt on. So you don't have to let that cure either. That will you know, air dry over time, or you can cure it, you know, put it in your oven or your flash dryer. So we're actually going to be doing this on a tan shirt. We're opening it up, same exact print placement. And you'll notice with these colored inks, once again, they're so much easier to print with. And plus, these shirts are easier to see what's going on too. So if you're going to start out with a job, start out with black ink on a lighter garment. It's going to be so much easier for you. The only reason we did it differently in this video is because, once again, remember, if you're going to do two colors of ink, do the lighter color first. But we got this measured out. We got it to center mark here. Got all smoothed out there. And then we're just going to accomplish the print. And we are printing. We're going to push stroke this. So even with black ink, we'll take a look at one pass. It's pretty dark. A little light right there. We're going to flood back up, and we're going to print again. Just do two passes. So once again, remember, if I'm not printing, I'm flooding my screen. So I'm flooding my screen. There's no ink. There's no image area that's open. I have enough ink to flood my screen. And there we have a beautifully printed black ink on a light garment. So there that is. Pretty cool, huh? Lots of fun. So we're actually going to take this, going to set it over the platen here, and we're going to dry it with our heat gun. Same process if you're using that iron in the curing sheets, but we're going to use the heat gun. Now, the cool thing about the black ink and the colored ink on the light garments is you can actually see them cure under the heat gun. You can see them dry out. You can see them kind of smoke out. And you do need to be a little more careful with these garments because they will scorch easier than a dark garment because they are that lighter pigment. So one thing you can also do with water-based inks to kind of set those inks in just a little bit more is after you're done printing, if you cure them a long time, throw them in your dryer on the high cycle. Throwing them in your dryer on the high cycle for like 30 minutes will help set that ink in a little bit more. The, the hottest it will actually get. And, um, but you do need to make sure that it's, it's dried first. If it's not dried first to begin with, and you throw it in your dryer cycle, it's going to ruin your dryer. So when we, we actually had a customer call us up and said, hey, your ink ruined my dryer. And we were like, what do you mean it ruined your dryer? What kind of conveyor dryer or flash dryer do you have? And they, they said they had a Magte dryer. So it was actually a closed dryer. They were taking wet ink before it was actually cured, throwing it in the dryer. So if you do that, make sure you're doing what I'm doing here, using the iron first as just an extra safety precaution and it might help set this water-based ink up just slightly more. Dryers don't get hot enough for plastisol ink. Cool. Shouldn't feel. Now you can actually take this ink with a, like your finger, get a little wet, lick your finger, and no ink should come off on it. So you can actually test this black ink that way too. You shouldn't actually have ink coming off on your finger. So there we have it. This is a black ink on a light garment. Pretty easy. Now we're gonna just going to pop a couple of these shirts off so we can actually show you how fast printing can be, even with a small press like this. Printing is a lot of fun. It's very creative, but you can also make some money on it. So a shirt like this, you know, if you're selling it at a flea market or something like that, it might sell for 10 bucks or 15 bucks. If you're selling it wholesale, it might sell for six, seven, eight bucks. You can actually print these with this kit if you have somebody else drawing them for you pretty fast and effectively. All right, what we're going to do here is doing a little production printing, have some fun. So we're just going to open the shirt up, put it on the platen, accomplish the print. Remember, open it up nice and big, center it out, make sure it's on that regist center registration mark. We're doing two passes, we're flooding up without putting any pressure on. We're lifting the screen up, we're flooding up, and this shirt's done. So let's say we have somebody else worrying about the curing process. We'll hand that off to them. Grab the next shirt, put it on the press, make sure it's all centered up nice and good, onto our center mark, flatten it out, pull the screen down, push the squeegee twice, flood that ink back up without putting any pressure on it, push the squeegee twice, oh I need a little bit more weight down there, 
this shirt's done. So we'll hand this off to the person to do the next cure. Then one more. So you can actually see how fast this printing process can go. And let's say I'm selling each one of these shirts and making three or four dollars of profit. Imagine how many shirts you can print in an hour. Now that's why people get into screen printing. It's, it's you know much further beyond the creative process, which is freaking awesome to see like your prints. Ooh, I forgot to flood the screen right there. So remember to flood the screen, otherwise your image will start to dry out. Now this nice part about this black ink is it doesn't dry nearly as fast because it's a wetter product. You don't have to press as hard with it either. So we just printed three shirts in a couple minutes. So you can actually do a lot of printing with this little machine, make some good money, and it's where a lot of people start to take this to the next level. They start expanding it. They start getting a bigger press with four colors or multiple stations because right now we just have one station to work off of and we don't even have a flash dryer. So a flash dryer actually sets, the, sets this ink up all at once without having to use that heat gun and go over it section at a time. Multiple stations means that I can be printing and flashing over here, flashing on the other side over there. Just check out our YouTube channel, you know, youtube.com slash Ryanet, and you type in production printing, you can see all sorts of this stuff that I'm talking about here. Also, multiple stations mean that I can do a lot more than just one color. I can have fun with it. I can be creative. So there's so much you can do with this process. It's a lot of fun, and you can make some good money at it. And we've seen people take these little kits, you know, have fun, start their own clothing lines, start their own clothing brands, be really creative, have fun in the process, and you know, take it and expand to larger equipment, even automatic presses that do the printing process automatically for you. One thing to mention when you're pulling off the garment, if it's wet, keep it open like this. See a lot of people in classes come and fold it like this. Now this is already dry, so it doesn't matter, but they'll fold it and the ink will get all over the place. So keep it open. Pretend it's like it's got cardboard on it, so it's not folding over itself on a wet print. Now you can actually use your oven to cure shirts too. The oven will cure a shirt in about a minute or so. So you can take your shirt, put it on the center rack of your oven on the bake settings. Now this oven's not on, but if it was on, we'd want to use like an oven mitt, obviously. Throw the shirt in there, shut the door, and let the shirt cure for about one minute. Oven's on 400 degree bake setting. Now be careful if you have a gas oven because you got open flame in there and you got cotton. So that's not good. So this mainly for like the electric ovens. Uh, they're much safer to use, but it allows you to go a little bit faster while curing a shirt. You can have a timer going, but you do need to be very careful with it. And you, you want to make sure that you're actually making sure that your ink is temped because if it's not curing in the oven or on your press with the heat gun or the iron, remember it's going to wash out. One more time on that curing process with the iron for the black ink. Put that parchment paper down. This is the curing paper. Now you can order this. You can order a lot more of this in bigger quantities from us. It's really cheap. And then you're going to use, this sheet lasts for about 10 prints or so, but go over each section once again for about two minutes. So each section for about two minutes, making sure the irons is as hot as can be. And you can have somebody else doing this while you're printing. But you can see if you're getting into production printing and you have a lot of shirts to print, let's say you get an order for 200 shirts. That's when getting that flash dryer really comes into play because that flash dryer can gear the shirt all at once. At the end of this video, we'll show you kind of the next steps and equipment to take. So what a multiple color press looks like, what a flash dryer looks like, and how easier it can make your life. So, you know, a great part about screen printing is you invested a couple hundred dollars to get this kit. And that's not a lot of money in the scheme of things because you sell a shirt for six bucks, you know. That's selling 30 shirts and basically making your money back. And it's a cool part of this industry is there's not a huge startup cost, but, you know, there's a lot of great opportunity. So check out the rest of the DVD uh, when we get into the expansion options because that will allow you to really take it to the next level and actually use more colors and go faster by using that equipment. And as you start to grow, you don't have to sit here with an iron the whole time. There are easier ways to do things. After you're done printing a great shirt, it's great to present it in a good way. Ryonet sells the flip fold exclusively in the screen print industry and this allows you to fold your garments quickly and professionally. Very, very affordable. This thing costs like not much more than 20 bucks. You put your shirt down, you fold it up, fold the bottom up if it's a larger shirt, if it's a smaller shirt you don't need to do that. You flip it, you flip it, you flip it, and you fold it. So professionally printed shirt, professionally printed fold. Great way to present and sell your clothing and even store your own personal shirts if you're using a home use in your kitchen or whatnot. So 
Check out the flip fold on the website. It's not a part of the package, of course, but it's a great way to take your shirts to the next level and professionally present them to your customers. Once we're done printing, it's time to clean. You never want to leave ink in your image area before you clean. So either use a junk test pellet or a junk shirt or your final print to clean the ink out of the shirt, the screen, excuse me. So I'm going to pull as much ink over this screen and get it through the screen as possible. So I'm not leaving any ink. You can use your squeegee to actually do most of the cleaning for you and then your job's a little easier. So as you see, I'm getting all the ink up on the squeegee and then pulling it up. So I don't have the very, very small amount of ink in the screen left as possible. So I'll simply set the squeegee very carefully on the side there. Take my ink, open the container, use one of my cleanup cards. I got my gloves on, of course, to scoop as much ink back into the container once again as possible. So as you can see here, these cleanup cards work really good to get as much ink off. So that's awesome. We'll set this on the side, and then we're going to use this cleanup card in the screen while the screen's on the press to get as much ink off as possible. Now you could actually take this screen at this time and wash it off outside, but, or you know, even in the sink, if you're using like a laundry room sink, now ink does get all over the place. So we don't recommend like using a nice sink, a, a bathtub to really clean this black ink because it's going to make a mess cleaning that ink up. And that's not what you want to do. So I'm just scooping as much ink off as possible, saving it. That also you know, saves you money because you don't have to throw away the sink. Once that's done, what we'll do now is we'll close this off and then we'll go do that whole thing again with the paper towels. So let's grab a couple of paper towels and go for it. All right, now that we got the ink cleaned up with the squeegee, we're just going to take some water once again quickly clean out the screen using a wet paper towel. You know, if it is important to use not normal paper towels if you can get some nicer shop towels. Ryanet also has some real nice, uh, we call them Ryle wipes, that work very good for soaking up ink. Uh, you all will also notice that this RC or this reduced, uh, the, the thinner water-based inks will actually clean up a lot easier than the other inks. So as, if you notice right now with just a little bit of water, these guys are cleaning up real nice and easy. So these inks will clean up, the black and colored inks will clean up a lot easier than the white ink because there's less pigment and, and opacity, less ink physically there, in fact. So we're cleaning that up. You know, the black ink does stain a little bit, and since we're not using this, these towels anymore, we're going to use the rest of these towels to just wipe it up. But you will see some black ink staining in your screen, more so than the white ink because of, because of the course the color of the ink itself. But once again, you want to make sure that you're cleaning out the entire screen. There's no ink left on the mesh. And then your platen as well. So we'll go ahead and do one more step. Go ahead and clean the platen off. We can actually use a little bit of degreaser for this. Spray a little degreaser on the platen, put a little bit of warm water on it, and then just use our paper towel to go ahead and just kind of scrub at it, getting that water-based adhesive off the platen. So if you use the pallet tape once again, which is an upgrade option, you don't have to do this. You just simply rip the pallet tape off and throw it away. But the water base is a lot nicer to clean off than that spray, spray tack adhesive. Spray tack adhesive, really the only advantage to it is it's a little easier to use, but for the most part, this stuff cleans off nice and easy. And just using some warm water over here, we are good to go. So clean that up all nice. And that just keeps your press clean. Same thing with your press. If you get some spray on it, if you get some, if you get some ink on it, just keep it nice and clean. Keep your work area nice and clean. And the nice thing about water base is you can clean up pretty much just everything with water, cleaning your squeegee off, um, your countertops, of course. And making sure to shut that ink jar up. So, this press is all cleaned off now, and the screen's all cleaned off. So what we're going to do now is actually show you how to reclaim the screen so you can go ahead and put another image on the screen for future use if you want to.
It's time to reclaim the screen. So the first step is to take the tape out, off the screen. Now, if you can see right here, we didn't do the best job of taping the screen up because we do have a little bit of ink residue in the bottom of that screen, mainly because we didn't put the tape wide enough across the screen. So we'll go ahead and throw this tape out. The nice thing about water base is this will wash off, so we can take some warm water. That ink does wash off. So once the screen's untaped, you want to make sure to get all the tape off the back of the screen as well. This does include the off-contact washer and the taped up registration marks right there. So we'll be sure to throw all that away, of course. Now, next step is to actually fill your emulsion remover up. So this is your Rionet emulsion remover right here. And this will actually take the image off the screen. So this is a concentrated formula, meaning that we're going to fill this bottle up the rest of the way with water. We can use warm water, cold water, it really doesn't matter. But you're going to slowly fill it up with water. And now you have a solution that you can now use to reclaim the screen with. So what this does is this actually takes the stencil off the screen. So you're going to spray it on the inside and the outside of the frame. This is going to loosen that stencil up. We're also going to pull out that new scrub brush we haven't used yet. So we had two scrub brushes with the kit. We're going to pull out the one that is not used. Ah, we're reclaiming the screen. I'm kind of sad. This is a cool print. But we can always make it again. That's the fun part. So this will actually degrade the emulsion. It is important that you properly expose the screen the right, the right amount of time, the first exact exposure. We covered you know, how to test that. You don't want that emulsion to be left soft. You will notice in this screen itself, it will be harder to get the, these, this part of the emulsion over here off the screen than the center of the screen. So once we got that all sprayed on, we're going to take our scrub brush with our, with our glove and start to scrub the screen off. And you can actually already see the emulsion start to degrade. You can see the image come off. Before we go too far, I'm going to get my scrub brush wet. And I'm actually going to spray some emulsion remover on the scrub brush itself. That always helps out a little bit. So now see that image come off? You can really see the image on the inside. And you're going to want to do most of your work with a scrub brush unless you have a pressure washer. If you have access to a pressure washer, you know, like one of those little home pressure washers or even a big gas power pressure washer, that's what big shops use when they're doing this process because it just blasts this emulsion out. You don't really have to do a lot of scrubbing. But the scrub brush makes it nice because it really will get most of the emulsion off for you and then you don't have to have a ton of pressure. Optimally, though, if you ever have problems cleaning a screen, the number one fix is pressure. So if you don't have access to a pressure washer, you can't get all your image out, take it down to the local car wash. Put a quarter in the machine and blast it out with one of those manual pressure washers at one of the local car washes. And that usually does a really good job. So as you can see now, the only areas that we're having a problem with is up here in the corner. And the reason this is is because the emulsions are thicker in the corner. And so we're just going to scrub with that just a little bit more. The one thing you never want to do is you never want to let this emulsion remover dry on the screen. If you ever let this dry on the screen, like you spray a bunch on and then you leave, it's going to what's called permanently lock your screen. If your screen's permanently locked, what happens is your image will never come off of it and you will have to buy a new screen. Not the worst thing in the world because screens aren't that expensive, but do you want to make sure that you're not leaving that emulsion to dry? Even now, if we, if we left the room for a couple minutes and this was allowed to dry, we'd be in trouble. So you can see, the longer the stuff sits on, the works in, the more it comes off. So pretty much got the whole screen cleaned off now. And now I'm going to take some pressure to it. So pressure is key here. If you have a strong garden hose, use that. This is biodegradable, so you can put it down your drain at this point in time and or outside. Warm water works great. So there we have it, it's coming off.
Now, sometimes you'll have a little bit of emulsion left in the corners, so you can kind of take your, your spray, sprayer, your nozzle, and scrub at that. So that's coming off now, right over there. Then just make sure your image is all cleaned off. There we have it. Now there's a new screen. Pretty cool. Ready to go. So at this point in time, if we're going to put a new image on it, what's the first step of the process? First step of the screen maker process is degreasing it. Now you do see the image in the screen still. What this is called is this is called a haze. So you don't want to see any ink in the screen. That shouldn't be there. If you see ink in the screen, that's a problem, and you need to use you know, a little bit more pressure with that scrub brush. There is a component called the green stuff that is a biodegradable dehazer and degreaser. So this doesn't come in the kit, but if you're going to get another chemical, it will actually clean your screens and degrease them at the same time, and it saves them for longer because it keeps that mesh a little cleaner. Now technically, you could just spray this you know, degreaser on the screen right now, scrub it around, let it sit for a couple minutes, and then degrease the screen. Some of this might come off and this, because it's just a stain, won't affect your new image. But if you keep your screens better looking, if, they, if the mesh stays cleaner, they will last a little longer. So we are going to show you, even though it doesn't come in the kit, we're going to show you real fast how to use that green stuff. The green stuff is completely eco-friendly, degreaser, dehazer, and abrader. So this preps your mesh very good, both taking the stain out. If you have some emulsion residue left in your screen, it will also take that out and it degreases it. So it does three things in one. Abrading means it preps the mesh so it holds the emulsion stencil a little bit better. How to apply this is it is a degreaser product so we want to apply it to the inside and the outside of the screen and if we're going to use our scrub brush we're going to use the degreaser scrub brush. And see how it has little porous particles in it? Those particles are actually abrading the mesh. So we're putting it on the inside of the screen and then we're flipping it over and putting it on the outside of the screen as well. And then you do let it sit for a couple minutes. You let it sit for about four to five minutes. Um, and then that allows the chemical, actually, the environmentally friendly chemical. Chemical never has a good sound to it. So it is environmentally friendly. It actually smells, smells like apples. It smells very, very good. It actually allows it to you know, bite into that haze and clean the rest of the screen mesh very, very well. So we're going to let it sit for a couple minutes and come back. All right, we've got to let this sit for about five minutes. We're going to come back and squirt it out with some hot water pressure. You definitely see that's before the stain and then this is after. So the stain's still there a little bit, but it's much, much lighter. And some parts of the stain, like right there, are like all the way gone. So this cleaned up the image a lot, and the cool thing is with this stuff is that we don't have to degrease it. And what we're doing right here is we're just going until we see no more suds in the screen, so we should be good. There we go. Shake the water out of it, and that screen looks a lot better. And we don't have to degrease it. The mesh actually feels sticky, which is great because the emulsion will stick to it. So remember, the next step would be letting it dry and then coating it with emulsion. And we'd be ready to go again. OK, remember we have two scrub brushes. This one is for the degreaser, which actually has the green stuff, degreaser to hazer on it. And this was for emulsion remover. You do want to make sure you clean these out with warm water. So we're just going to clean them out with warm water and then keep them as that chemical. So you remember from earlier in the video, we recommended maybe putting some Ziploc bags together, writing on those Ziploc bags, and or just having a, a place to store them, one for degreaser specifically, and then also one for emulsion remover. So just remember that they clean out great with warm water, but keep them clean and in their separate environment. Don't, don't cross-contaminate these guys. Now we've learned how to use the screen printing starter kit. We created a black ink on a white shirt print or a light garment print. We also created a white ink on a black garment print. These are just simple one color prints. 
And as you saw throughout this process of learning how to accomplish these prints, when you create your first print on your press, you're probably going to want to take it to the next level. Experiment with new designs. Maybe do some two-color stuff. Maybe do a poster print. Maybe do a bigger print. Well, we're going to show you some products now that will help you take your screen printing game to the next level. This is a great starter kit, extremely affordable, and help you get into the game of screen printing. But now we'll show you some other products that you can use as you supplement your screen printing operation as you grow. Maybe you won't grow, but a lot of customers have a lot of fun with the process and do amazing things. So if you want to grow, here's kind of some of the next steps. First of all, it's screen printing, right? So you're going to need more screens. This is the screen that comes in a kit is a 16 by 20 inch. These are OD, so we measure screens in outer dimensions. So 16 by 20 inch means 16 by 20 inches. It's a wood screen and it's a 156 mesh screen. We didn't really talk about mesh sizes because with this current printing kit, you don't need to talk about mesh sizes. Let's spend a few minutes talking about mesh so you can explain and understand how to incorporate other mesh sizes with future prints. So mesh is measured by how many threads cross per square inch. So if we got a microscope out, we could see 156 threads, this is 156 mesh screen, crossing per every square inch circle, or excuse me, square inch square on this screen. Now, mesh sizes goes up and down from there. The reason we chose the 156 mesh screen is because it works pretty good for both the white ink, which is thicker, and the black ink, which is thinner, that comes with the kit. Lower mesh sizes, actually the most popular mesh in the industry is called the 110 mesh. It's got a bigger opening because there's fewer threads crossing per inch. Well with 110 mesh, if we were going to print that black ink through it because that black ink is so thin, it would literally flood through the mesh and create a disaster on our printing press. So that's why we don't include a 110 mesh in this kit. But if you're going to be doing a lot of white ink printing or if you're switching to plastisol ink, getting a couple 110 mesh screens is not a bad idea. Also, if you want to do some finer detail, going higher up in mesh size is also not a bad idea. You know, the next step up is like a 200 or a 230 mesh. The three most popular mesh sizes for screen printing are 110, 156, and 230. That gives you a range of high and low. But there's also specialty mesh sizes like 86 and 61, which you can do some really cool prints with glitter ink. So if, if you want to go lower in the mesh size, ensure that you know what these meshes are used for. On our website and on YouTube, we have a lot of good videos and articles that talk about mesh sizes and how they correlate to ink. Also, if you're looking at ink on the website, every ink page mentions what mesh size it should be printed through. So there's a lot of great resources that you can use to use, you know, find out more information about screens and mesh. So this is just a standard small screen. As you can see, we printed with a great with a starter kit, but it did limit our shirt size a little bit. So the most popular screen that we sell is actually a 20 by 24 inch screen and it's an aluminum frame. The aluminum frame, as we mentioned before, does not warp or you know, kind of suck that water in during the screen printing process. So this is actually a higher mesh, that's why it's a yellow mesh. This is an aluminum 20 by 24 screen which gives you a much larger shirt print area. You know, imagine this screen going on a shirt versus this screen. So you can do a lot larger designs using these screens. A lot of customers, these screens will fit actually perfectly in your press here. So a lot of customers, instead of investing, you know, obviously the smaller wood screens are a little bit less expensive, but this is a better long-term investment because of the durability of the frame and the size. So you can visit the screen page of our website and see all the different aluminum frames and or wood frames, you know, small or large format, available for sale. Now let's move to the actual press itself. So your press comes with the standard 16 by 16 platen, but a lot of times you want to do different sizes of designs, you might want to do smaller shirts. So we do have a complete line of platens and a platen kit for this screen printing starter press. This, these platens actually have brackets underneath them, so they can simply pop right on the press, slide on, screw down, and slide off. They're available in all different sizes and we can even make custom platens for you as well. So whether you're wanting to do legs or sleeves like this one right here, you know, larger platens with a neck attachment like this, we have all sorts of platens for this press that simply slide on, slide off very quickly and easily. So if you want to do different stuff, check out those platens on the website as well. Now let's talk about chemicals. Rylan has a complete line of environmentally friendly chemicals for both water-based and plastisol ink. So depending on what ink you're going to be using long term, check out these EnviroLine chemicals. They're available in nice little kits like this, which include all your restock chemicals that you need, 
degreasers, we already showed you the green stuff, which is a great chemical to use and does two things or actually three things at once. But these kits are both great for restock and for adding to your chemical line. There are a few other chemicals like dehazers that were not included in the original kit that you might want to check out as well. But once again, that green stuff kind of does that as well. So that's why the green stuff's so cool. Just tout that again. But there are different options. You know, that was a pint kit. Here's a quart kit. And a quart kit, you know, obviously, the more you buy, the more you save. So as you start to consume more chemical, you're probably even going to want to buy them in gallon containers. And, you know, a gallon of chemical goes a much longer ways than a small quart or a pint. And the EnviroLine is great because if you're doing that out of your house, completely eco-friendly. We do have more industrial chemicals as well if you end up upgrading to plastisol inks and or do it more in an industrial fashion. Along with chemicals, there's these great cleaning wipes. Cleaning wipes are good for both your hands, your equipment. They're very, very fast and easy to use. Let's say we got some ink on, you know, ink on my hand. This is how easy these wipes clean it up. So ink, clean up these wipes. These are called crazy clean wipes. As far as cleanup purposes go, especially if you end up switching to Plastisol ink, super, super easy to use and work great. Um, just, just very, very affordable and easy to have. So these are called crazy clean wipes. Check these guys out as well. And once again, all this stuff's available on the website. And we also have a very easy to follow kind of like a reorder list and extra supply list that will follow up with you via email and or you can download along with the starter kit as a PDF resource guide. Test pallets, we covered these, available in both white and black, great for test printing. You don't have to use a t-shirt, you can just use a, a couple cent test pallet. Curing sheets, if you do end up sticking with your iron, you can reorder the silicone paper or Teflon paper curing sheets to cover the ink from the iron. So we have those available. Um, these are cut down in size. Film. Film for your inkjet printer. You get five sheets with your kit. So you can buy either 25 packs, 50 packs, or 100 packs of this waterproof film in much larger sizes. So this is a small size, basically good for the small starter kit. However, we do have sizes much larger. If you end up going with those larger Epson printers like the Epson 1100, or the, 40, uh, the 1440, you can go with the larger sizes of film positive as well, which means that you can do a lot bigger images, especially if you're using the bigger screens that we discussed. Also, these ink knives, we kind of showed this a lot in the, in the video, but great for cleanup, great for handling ink. Uh, let's move on to ink. You know, we do have lots of different colors and color packages available of all the different styles of ink. So we have white ink, opaque and transparent white ink for water-based printing. The ink that came in your kit is an opaque ink, so we do have an transparent ink that's thinner, much easier to use, and but not quite as bright and opaque on the garment. Here we see like a red and a blue. These are ready for use, water-based inks, and very thin, kind of very consistent format with that black ink that you got with the kit. Also, if you're interested in, in working with ink that doesn't have to be cleaned out of the screen every day, those plastisol inks that we keep recommending, those are what most screen printers use nowadays they don't dry in your screen. You do have, have to have some a little bit more aggressive chemicals to clean them up, but the citrus chemicals that come with the EnviroLine, very, very easy to use. But the advantage of those plastisol inks is they, they hit into your garment, they bind into your garment very, very well. And they're more of like a rubber-based, so it's plastisol plasticizers. And those plasticizers won't dry out like water-based will dry out. So that base of the ink is very much, much more user-friendly as far as using over and over again. So if you have a long production run, you can literally leave the screen up without having to clean it up, come back the next day and continue printing with the same ink in the screen. So check out Plastisol ink. Plastisol ink, once again, has to cure at 320 degrees, same way water-based ink does, but very easy, for, very easy to use. You can see a ton of information about these inks on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Ryonet. Um, hand cleaner and emulsion remover. So emulsion remover paste, if you have trouble getting those screens clean, this paste is a very aggressive emulsion remover. But once again, as we mentioned, getting a pressure washer. So if you see a great deal on a pressure washer, you know, I've seen them as cheap as 60 bucks. If you're you know, going through Target and see, hey, pressure washer on sale, grab it. Because that pressure washer will save you a ton of time and keep your screens cleaner longer by just blasting it out with pressure washer. But this emulsion remover paste works great for cleaning out those tough screens. This hand cleaner, probably one of the most popular products that we sell. Very easy to use uh, if you start using water-based inks and or even this, um, we are using water-based inks, start using plastic inks. You can use this wet, smells great. Kind of like that orange cleaner, but it's actually more affordable than that and it works better. So this is great 
either dry, just wiping my hands up like this, or using it in the sink. So it's the hand cleaner, it's, it's in a blue format. As you're printing, you're going to need more squeegees. So this is a larger squeegee, works with the larger frames. And this is a metal squeegee. Metal squeegees are awesome because they clean up real nice. And the blades last a lot longer. If you end up printing a lot of shirts, these blades actually dull out. And that means that they don't release the ink through the screen as good. So nice part about the metal or the aluminum handle blades, these are called the Ergo4 squeegees. They feel better in your hand. And they actually hold the squeegee better. Plus, you can turn the squeegee around and replace the blade very quickly and easily. We talked about the screen palette tape, of course. Great product to use, especially if you're going to be doing a lot of printing different designs. You can just rip it off your palette. We also talked about the flip fold, easy to use and easy to fold shirts and, and make a very professional presented uh, folded shirt for your customer. Ultimate cleanup cards, these cards are great for cleanup and available in 300 packs and 1500 packs, which is pretty much going to last you forever. Just a few pennies a piece. And then tape, screen tape, uh, you're going to use this. And you, it is very important to use that screen specific tape because as you saw in the video, we were cleaning that screen out pretty aggressively with water. And could you imagine doing that with like trying to use a masking tape? That, that masking tape would just completely degrade in water and or the other chemicals if you end up switching over to plastisol ink. So screen tape is definitely affordable. Like you can buy them in six packs, save a little bit of money. We also have a complete line of aerosol products. Aerosol products are more industrial for use, but they do work very fast and aggressive to clean up those screens and our spray adhesive. So you can check out the spray products on the website to see what, how those aerosol products can work as far as the cleaning and uh, use format. Make your life a little bit easier if you end up going into the production format. So that's most of the products that you're going to want to use you know, as far as upgrading to the next levels. Pretty much anything in this industry you're going to find on our website. And if there's anything that you need you can't find, feel free to search for and or just give us a call, connect with us on Facebook. We value your business very much. This is just the first step of the process and our goal as a company is to develop a long-term relationship with you. You know, We teach classes and as a part of this kit you can come to one of our classes here in the U.S. for free. You know, Come to our how to start screen printing class. You don't have to even pay any money. And it's a quick overview. Learning hands-on is so important through the process because you can see me doing it, but I've been doing it for 12 years. And to get those right techniques down, we can literally show you within a couple passes of the squeegee and completely change that learning curve for you. And we do find that customers that come to classes are much more successful moving forward because they just expedite that learning process so quickly. So if you're around New York, you know, Florida, Arkansas, um, the Midwest area, California, or Washington, check out one of these classes and we will be expanding those in the future to other areas of the country as well. You, know, you can also see round at trade shows throughout the year too and there's classes available at these trade shows as well. But their the classes at trade shows are uh, only a short format and typically you don't get hands-on time. The round at classes are pretty much all hands-on so come on in and learn the process and print all sorts of different cool inks and different designs. It's a ton of fun. So what's the most important part of making this shirt? Well, obviously the screen is to make it, but once it's printed, the most important part is to cure it. If you don't cure it, it's going to wash out. Now the next step in the curing process, or the next kind of the uh, evolution of curing, would be a flash dryer. Flash dryer will cure the entire shirt at once. This has a heating element underneath it. In fact, I'll just raise it up and show you guys. It's a hot heating element that emits radiant heat. This is infrared heat that will cure an entire shirt at once. So this is actually designed and works best with plastisol ink. Plastisol and or water-based ink has to reach 320 degrees in order to cure. You can actually get a simple laser temp gun. And there are, they're all available on our website, of course. But a laser temp gun to actually shine at the ink and it shoots this laser beam and will measure the temperature of the ink on the shirt. So you can know when that temperature is reaching 320 degrees and that ink is cured. Now, with water-based ink, you do have to let it sit for just a little bit longer because the way water-based ink cures is that water has to evaporate out of the ink before it will actually reach that curing point. So it needs to sit a little bit longer. Typically, depending on you know, your shirt, see that water evaporate out? We just let that steam for a second. If you were doing this for about, I'd say about a minute and a half to two minutes, um, maybe a little bit lower depending on how much ink is on the shirt. So getting one of those laser temp guns is a great way to measure that. But this is way, way easier than using a, you know, one of those little heat guns, which is easier than using an iron. But as you're doing more shirts, great way to do this. And once again, you know, this will ensure that no ink is actually coming off on your 
customers, because if you're selling a shirt that washes off, it doesn't look good, right? And it will happen if you're not curing it. So it sounds a little scary, but really it's not. You just need to make sure that those security parameters are controlled. Now, one way to test this is do a wash test before you actually sell the shirt, so you can throw it in the wash. And or if you're starting a production run or getting a new unit like a flash dryer, test your parameters out. So throw it in the wash on a you know, quick cycle and make sure the ink stays in. If it stays in through the wash test, you're good to go. You're also those stretch tests like we showed you as well. So one way to do that is that flash dryer and it helps speed things up and expedite the process as you move forward. You know, larger format shops or if you actually go beyond, you would be getting a conveyor dryer, which you can see on our YouTube website or our website. And those conveyor dryers actually, it's like a belt that you simply just take the shirt, throw it on, comes out the other, it's like a pizza oven. So it's pretty cool because it really speeds things up. And you can go, if I had this press and a conveyor dryer, I could probably print of this shirt 120, 130 pieces an hour without sweating hard. So you can go really fast when you, get the, when you invest a little money in bigger equipment. Now, the press that you have here is our basic press. We do have a line of silver presses, which is an aluminum constructed press, and also Riley Hopkins presses for larger formats. So check out some of the advertisements on this DVD of the silver press and the Riley Hopkins press to see how you can use those in your business moving forward. As you're upgrading your equipment, keeping your starter press around is a great idea because you can actually use it for tag printing or sleeve printing or very specific one color prints and actually take it on site. So this equipment is actually totally portable and you can take it on site, site event printing or to like let's say a fair or perhaps just a little flea market to sell shirts and print them on site. People love screen printing. They love to see the process happen. It's magical to most people that they don't know how it happens. So if you can show the process happening, your chances of selling the garments that you're printing are much higher. This concludes our DVD on how to use your screen printing starter kit. Our goal as a company is to make this more than just a hobby for you. So now it's time to start. Have fun, experiment. And along the way, if you need any help, just contact us. Well, this is the first shirt we printed with our screen printing starter kit. And we'd love to see your first shirt. So just connect with us on Facebook, post a picture of your first shirt, and we'd love to share it around. We hope you have fun along the way, and once again, if you need any help, don't be hesitant to call us. Thanks a lot, and enjoy the world of screen printing.